This is the Powerlifting America podcast, and today we're talking with Zen McCollum, the reigning equipped 120 plus kilo national champion. Zen had a huge year in 2022, winning his first national title, finishing second at Junior Worlds in Turkey, and sixth at Open Worlds in Denmark, where he put up his biggest total yet. He's still a junior and will be defending his national title in six weeks at Equip Nationals in Scottsdale. There are big things happening on the Equip side for Powerlifting America, with a lot of lifters coming over from USVI. The US national team is going to be way more stacked than it was last year, so we want to have Zen on here to get the conversation started about the equip side of Power of Team America. But before we start, don't forget that the grand finale of Power of Team America's national championship season is sub junior, junior, masters, and equip nationals starting June 2nd in Scottsdale, Arizona. The classic divisions are full already, and the equip side is not far behind. So sign up now before it's too late to make it onto a U.S. national team. Thank you to SPD and Aleko for their continued partnership with Power of Team America. If you're looking to compete in drug tests of Power of Team, whether you're just starting out or you want to compete with the best in the world, make sure you go to Power of America america.com and be sure to follow us on instagram at powerlifting underscore america okay let's get into this interview with zen mccollum what's up i got zen mccollum equipped 120 kilo plus junior silver silver medalist from worlds welcome to the pa podcast man how's it going great it's a pleasure to be on the show paul yeah thanks uh so just first let's just do a little catch up how things been going for you how's training going Training has been going pretty good. I'm currently around six weeks out from PA Equipped Nationals in Scottsdale, um, where I'm looking to defend my open title from last year in Orlando. So training for that has been going pretty well, especially on my equipped bench. It's been a, you know, kind of a hit or miss kind of thing. You know, I, I left the audience <laughs> on the edge a couple of times at Worlds last year. More, more miss than hit. <laughs> more miss than hit. The 0 for 2 kind of edge of your seat kind of thing. You know, that's, <laughs> it was a repeat in Denmark as well. You know, yeah, We're trying no. not to have that in Scottsdale, try to be a little bit more consistent, but most open, definitely open training raw. well. Open yep. raw, bro. Just open raw and get no. your opener. I don't open raw, dude. I'd rather bomb out on bench and open raw. <laughs> like, you know, I can't, I can't put uh, myself in a position to open it. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, just try to make three attempts, bro. Like, all right, well, we'll get into, we'll get into the details. We don't want to yeah. spoiler alert. Homie only went one for three on bench at junior worlds and at open worlds, but we'll get into that. But um, just talking about stuff that's like happened lately. Did you watch Sheffield? Yes, I did. Um, there was some pretty stellar performances. Um, and the one that really struck me, of course, as a super heavyweight is Jesus Solivares hitting the biggest total ever in raw lifting. It was a spectacular total, like perfect day. He got saved by the powerlifting gods when Grant sprinted to the jury at the end to contest that last deadlift. But it was a really good show. Yeah, that was awesome. Uh, awesome to see a uh, super heavy going nine for nine, having a perfect day and winning the contest, you know, um, and that was something that I talked on the previous episode with Matt Gary about a lot, you know, is making attempts going nine for nine. And you see that the two winners at Sheffield both did that. So like, that's, that's why I'm trying to get you to, uh, that's why I'm trying to get you to make some more bench attempts here. Bro. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's also a thing with James and myself, you know, James Townsend, He's the national head coach for the open team, the national team head coach, whatever. Um, yeah. He's also the one who's been coaching my bench for the last okay. 20 weeks or so since December. And we've been making a lot of you know progress with the bench shirt. And he's been giving me a lot of helpful advice to be more consistent in the equipment and how to like dial it to be more passive and more aggressive when we need that heavier third attempt and how to like get an opener in we're, I'm making a lot of strides with him and I'm very appreciative of it. Um, squat and deadlift is still under Joe cap though. So everything should okay. be good. Well, good. I mean, that was one of the questions I had for you is kind of clarifying what your coaching situation is. Um, like who's coaching you and all this kind of stuff. It's like, you're kind of being coached by a lot of the, the great equipped lifters. Yeah. So it, I operate mostly on the napkin system when it comes to coaching, it's kind of, what Joe Cap did when I initially started training equipped again, you know, cause I was getting back in, I signed up for a PA meet. My first PA meet was the uh, local rumble on the Rio in New Mexico. Mike Z ran that shout out Mike Z yeah. and best wraps in the game, by the way. And he, I just asked Joe, Hey, you know, program me, write something down on a napkin and give it to me and I'll follow it. And I have followed that same programs structure with slight adjustments here and there for the last four meets. So I did it for that local meet. I did it for nationals. I did it for both worlds and I'm doing it now for nationals, but, and I also have 
Yeah, and I've done a raw off season with um, Gene Bell. I just sent him a DM like, hey, you know, you said at the banquet at Denmark, you'd write me something. So he did, and I followed it for a good eight weeks. And I'm starting to, like, you know, get into a peak, and I went back to what Joe wrote me down for. But, like, in terms of actual formal coaching, the only person that I've been getting actual structured coaching from is James, and that's on bench. Okay. And where he's right now, yep. right now the program every week for you, you're sending in videos, all that kind every of stuff. week. Yep. Absolutely. Good. Yes. Good. And Did I also send them event? videos on my squad. Oh yeah. I mean, it's not great. Um, I recently hit a training PR at three twelve and a half kilos around six eighty nine, mm -hmm. but my meat PR huge, is still six twenty eight. Yep. Yeah. But those are, those are huge numbers. And for like, uh, you know, a lot of the audience is raw lifters and stuff. So hearing about, a junior out here benching in the 600s and stuff like it's pretty crazy to see so um but so you know i was kind of asking a little bit more about sheffield um so what other performances did you know really stood out for you at sheffield i mean i would say seeing bonica hit 618 was cool um i forget her name that new zealand evie mm -hmm. corrigan evie, evie corrigan yeah i did not expect her to win at all I didn't expect her to even place. I was like, I don't know who this person is. And then she came out of nowhere and won, like, you know, doing a 104 point something percent of the world record. It was insane to see like how many women went over a hundred percent. Keiko did really good. Aiden had a little bit of his, a little bit of controversy with his third squad, got overturned by the jury. Overall, there was a lot of great performances at that meet. And mm. it was cool to see the bench rule kind of, Nail some people in the ass as well. It was surprising, you know, seeing Eddie Berglund and Agatha Sika, who, I mean, I, I respect Ag Agatha because she's both a raw and an equipped lifter at yeah. the highest level. She won the World Games. Yeah. And she's a raw world. She got silver, I think, at Raw Worlds um, yeah. 2022 in South Africa. Lost, on, so lost she's, some body weight. Yeah, lost some body weight. She, she's very incredible. And she also has a really sick equipped bench to see her struggle with her first two benches and with the new rules feeling it out and stuff and then coming back and smoking your third was awesome to see such a in such equipped fashion in in such zen fashion right yeah that that <laughs> equipped lifters i mean that clutch play never leaves you once you do it you can do it whenever unless it's absolutely screwed you know i think a lot Which of raw lifters are like shitting their pants if they miss two two lifts oh yeah no you, missing you an miss opener. your opener and your second yeah. like, you're, you're pretty much like i'm dead i mean you get you 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 miss your opener raw and you know you're you're nervous you're you're shitting yeah. bricks because you're shitting you, bricks. <laughs> you're going in your you're getting in your head you're like did i fuck something up that i met that i miss you know i yeah. die miss peak or did i like not recover well or did i not make weight and come back enough like there's a lot of things going through your head yeah but on the equip side of things if you miss your opener, who cares? If you miss your <laughs> second, who cares? Like, you know, you have um, more chances to fix things. And that's the beauty of yeah. lifting and watching it is that, you know, you when you're watching raw lifting and someone's 0 for 2, you're just going to default to they're going to bomb out yeah. unless some miracle happens. If you're 0 for 2 and equipped, yeah. you don't know what's going to happen. They could just come back, smoke this lift like it was a last warm up, or they could, sh you know, shit the bed. You don't know. So that, that, you know, anticipation really makes equipped kind of, they're very watchable in my opinion, because the battles are so weird. The attempts, when you see them on paper, there are people who open raw, there yeah. are people who open in a looser shirt and then switch to a tighter shirt or a looser suit to tie, tighter suit. And the attempts on the opening nominations and the opening opener boards or whatever, like when you see it on the, the, the screen, you don't know if that's your final standings or not. There's no way. It's a little bit closer. Um, with Raw, you can kind of guesstimate where people are, but with Equip, you have no clue what they're doing and what their strategy is because there's so many avenues. Yeah, there's so many more cards to play in Equip. And I think that's, Absolutely. that's really what struck me. Um, the first time that I watched it was with you in Orlando last year. That was the first yeah. time I'd seen Equip in person uh, or even really paid too much attention. I mean, I knew a little bit of like who the who the big names were and yeah. see their Instagrams and stuff like that. But I never really watched and equipped me before. And um, that's what struck me right away was just how exciting it was, whether you're going to make an attempt or miss an attempt. There's a lot of misses, 
but like i think raw misses are boring um there's not a lot of drama equip misses are crazy it's like you have it like up and it looks like it's popping off your chest like perfectly on bench and then boom it just like dumps it on your right on or your you face dump it on just, your stomach i've yeah, done that it, as well and it's and it's just there, there's just the crash and burn is way more crazy um on equip so like even the misses are a little bit more exciting but like you said there's this whole anticipation of like are you going to get even a single bench in or not which we saw with you both times um at both of the world championships that you competed in in 2022 and uh, you had a very dramatic flair i remember the one in juniors especially like you just like popping up and like you're like hey whatever <laughs> i i wet my sweat yeah yeah the yeah, yeah i was sweating before i yeah. it didn't really make me that nervous uh, it was a little bit nerve wracking. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to just sit here and say I'm, I was okay the whole time. No, I was mentally shitting bricks because yeah. I adjust, I, you know, you're in the hot seat there. You miss your first. You're like, okay, we'll adjust it for the second and we'll be fine. That's what happened in Orlando. Yeah. And I missed my second. And now I'm in a position I've never been in before at Worlds. Nonetheless, I felt kind of discouraged because I just thought in my head, I flew halfway across the world and I'm going to bomb out of juniors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was in metal contention and now I'm fighting for a total. Yeah. But um, shout out John Burford. Mm -hmm. You had him on the pod a few episodes yeah, yeah, yeah. ago. John Burford. Shout out John Burford. He kept me sane when I was, you know, because I was running through all these scenarios in my head. I mean, if I bombed out, I would have taken it. Mm -hmm. I would have went out on my shield. Because yeah. if you bomb out an equipment, I think that's a rite of passage. I think every equip lifter has to do it at least once. Yeah. Uh, if you're really consistent, you know, like you, you're playing with, uh, you're playing with fire. But some of the best, you know. some of the best equip lifters have done it on the biggest of big stages. Oh yeah, Joe Capolino, um, he bombed <laughs> out at World Games. You know, this you don't year. give a shit out after a certain point. If you bomb out, you bomb out. Everyone bombs yeah. out. You know, Blaine Sumner bombed at World Games too on deadlift. Although it's kind of embarrassing to bomb on deadlift. So, you know, John kept me <laughs> in my mindset. Shout out, little dig at Blaine there. Hello. <laughs> I respect Blaine, but yes, he, you know, bombing on deadlifts is a little bit embarrassing. And, and also, the powerlifting gods will probably smite me for saying that. So you're saying like, if you want to be like bomb out, like a, like a legit champion equipped lifter, you want to bomb out like Joe Cap did and bomb yeah, out on bench. just go out on my shield bomb out on bench is the most ideal <laughs> bomb out on squat okay it happens bomb out on deadlift mm -hmm. like what the fuck you could have pulled raw you know yeah yeah but john was great he kept me in my you know he kept me out of my head uh -huh. and he pulled me up before my bench he pulled on my sleeve pulled down on my sleeve pulled down on my collar now you know i was like are you sure that's gonna touch and like just trust it you'll be fine Mm -hmm. And champs make the adjustment. I remember him saying that as I was about to go out to the, the platform and mm -hmm. I was in the staging area. I am mentally, I am like racing through all these scenarios and mm -hmm. I could only hear myself thinking, don't fuck this up. Focus on the, the things that brought you here with a quick bench and trust your coaches and it'll be fine. And everyone's like cheering and screaming. The announcers getting everyone hyped up. But me personally, when the crowd gets super hyped up, when I'm in a mindset of do or die, mm -hmm. it's kind of a distraction. Okay. So that's why you see in the live stream, the replay that I shush the crowd. I feel, okay. I don't feel like a dick for doing that because I really needed quiet in that room mm. to, uh, you know, get the focus I needed to finish. Cause I've yeah. never been in this situation before. Now that world's about to bomb on bench. So I get on there, got the lift off. Everything was fine. And I get, just do the bench. I mean, I bring it down the same way. It actually touched a little bit harder than the first two, but the shirt was a little bit more supportive. But as soon as I got the press command, it just rocketed back up. And I'm like, I have to hold it here. Cause the second one, I kind of like flew it back into the rack. So I'm just like, hold it outwards towards your feet as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And then I got the rack command and I got up and I saw two whites and I just went, okay, we're good to go here. So <laughs> you're on the board yeah. now, baby. And Absolutely. Although don't sell yourself short. That was a world record. Was it not? Uh, it was not the oh, world wasn't. record in my, Oh no. The world record. Oh, shit. I thought it was a world the, record. No, the, the three lift junior world record on bench is like three, I would say like three forty something in oh, equipped. Shit. Okay. I mean, damn bro. I'm not All too right. sure off the top of my head who, um, who did it, 
but it 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 definitely wasn't that. Okay, damn. I, for some reason, I thought it was a world record. I, I, I was just it was it back. was good. I mean, I got benched silver. There was one guy who benched two and a half kilos more, but my plan was to bench two ninety at that meet, and I kind of screwed it up. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's the okay. thing with you know bleeding kilos by you know not need, knowing the equipment. A lot of a lot of it is learning how to use the gear. Yeah, for sure. Um, so at that meet, you came in second still, you know, you did a great to, job. Like to Ray Boring, who just yeah. won the USAPL collegiate nationals in the 140 plus kilo class. Yeah. So that's and a so, tidbit. I mean, he's, he's a really good lifter. He's like, he you know, one of the best lifters in the world. And so it's really no shame in coming in second behind Ray. And yeah. I mean, you were, you were on, you were kind of on pace. If you, if you didn't mess up your bench, if you had made a few extra, few more lifts, you could have challenged him. It, one of the things that really messed me up big time and mm-hmm. has changed the way I organized my equipment before my meet, I put on my backup suit by mistake. Oh, for squatting? Not the tailored one that I was squatting 900 plus in. I put on my, my stock suit. Oh, shit. And oh. I, I, was, I hit 385, but it was a tough 385. And I know that if I was in the tighter kit, I would have gotten at least 410 or 405. So what happened? And you that would have put you... me closer. You, they looked yeah. the same. They were both black TRX squat suits, and um, one of them looked slightly smaller than the other, but that was actually the stock one, and I made the mistake of putting on the wrong one. And in the okay. rush of that meet, that meet was really fast, and I wasn't used to being at Worlds yet, so I, I made a few rookie mistakes. Now I know how to organize my gear a little bit better. I, with Titan stuff, when I was going to Denmark, I – religiously double check the tag numbers on everything and make sure every suit was right. Mm-hmm. And with my Inzer stuff, cause I'm going back to using Inzer squat suits for this meet. I cut the tag off my backup one. So I know that's the looser one. Okay. Yep. And so you're so, saying, you know, that's you're what we're switching to Inzer going into nationals. Yes. I squat better in Inzer gear. Okay. It's gotcha. kind of fun, funny. I mean, I've tried Titan, but like their equipment just doesn't fit right on me. Mm-hmm. the the suits in order for me to get the tiny ass the tight ass hips that i need they tend to like make the legs not t- they make the legs too small and like i'm mm-hmm. struggling to get them on my quads so it doesn't really it fits a little bit goofy and they stretch out pretty fast so i have to retailer them funny for a super tight suit they have to retailer them i mean i squatted pretty well in a super centurion at open worlds but i feel more fluid and natural in a trx it's personal preference yeah you know most people squat better in a titan because it's just it's a more bread and butter type suit i think that you need a specific build to squat really well on a trx like joe capolino squats really well on a trx yeah all right so let's uh I mean, basically, we already kind of did the recap on Turkey, like as far as everything that happened on the platform. But tell us a little bit more, like what it was like just being at your first world championships. I mean, you just were coming off of your first national championship in yep. the open division. You also, mm-hmm. you know, won the junior uh, yeah. national title as well. That's what's qualifying you to go to junior worlds in Turkey. Walk us through kind of like the whole experience of just going. Was this your first time going overseas like this? Uh, I've I've gone overseas for uh, personal plan, personal leisure, okay, uh, and family. I have oh, a lot wow. of family in China, and I went on a oh. trip to Europe in 2017. So I have traveled internationally before. Okay, I'm good. no stranger to that, but this is the first time I'm going overseas to compete. Yeah, and we're going to Turkey, which is not like oh the meets in Canada. My yeah. original Junior Worlds plan was in 2020 was to go to uh, open nationals in Vegas in 2020, back when I was in USA powerlifting. And we, um, we were supposed to do that one. I had a pretty good shot at winning juniors or at least being an alternate to go to juniors back then. Mm-hmm. And then COVID hit, but that would have been crazy because junior worlds that year would have been in Birmingham, Alabama. It would have been sick. Oh, okay. Nice. You yeah. know, so it would have been within my own country. It wouldn't have been that bad. But World games preview COVID threw a wrench in the works. I kind of had a funk with powerlifting. I took a break and then I came back in 2022. And now I'm thinking, okay, Junior Worlds is going to be in Ecuador, but then they changed it to Istanbul. But I took it. And when I won nationals, as soon as I got the email inviting me to go to Junior Worlds, I emphatically said yes, because I wanted to do that before I aged out. 
Yeah. So the traveling was a little bit tough to get used to, especially that venue in Turkey. It was like an hour and a half away from Istanbul airport. It was a pretty long bus track away. Yeah. And the transport, the transport showed up. Funny enough, we were the ones holding the transport up because everyone wanted to get fucking Burger King after we got off the plane. But, you know, we got on the transport and the AC shit the bed halfway through the ride. So it was a hot, humid oh, drive to the hotel. So that's kind of a precursor of things to come. <laughs> that should have been your yes, first morning the, flight. The, you know, the, the weather conditions. I was made aware that the IPF doesn't always host worlds at the perfect venues. Mm-hmm. there there's no like none of these places are like pristine yeah usually for especially for junior worlds or masters worlds and this was really a last save. minute this was a last yes. minute change of venue it was. as well so you're probably it was, expecting yes. this to be maybe a little not not as on par with what they've done in the past even so yeah and uh, we got to the venue but even then like even at the banquet gaston was like yeah this place it was bad (laughs) you know that's he was polite about it you Uh know he had to be professional but in in essence he was like yeah no this place sucked and i'm sorry guys the ac situation in my room worked some of my teammates did not have ac the cable on one of the units was actually cut in half in one of the rooms so it wouldn't work mine thankfully worked Uh, the food was a little bit hard to get used to i was actually paranoid as hell about getting food poisoning when I was there because I wasn't used to the food. So I wouldn't really, the first day I was there, I was very picky about what I was eating. I had the palate of a six-year-old. Yeah. I heard. And I told my dad that I told my dad that when I was just texting him, you know, back at home and he chewed me out. He was like, eat real fucking food or you're going to fuck up at the meat. So I'm like, okay. I went down to the hotel bar, found anything that was similar to what I was eating at home. You know, I had a bunch of chicken fajitas. They somehow had chicken fajitas and some pasta dishes. And I was eating that. There was actually a fun moment in the hotel restaurant with me and Luke Mellon, the other super heavyweight junior uh-huh. that we sent, where we were eating spaghetti and we we just scarfed down the bowls. And when the waiter came by and we asked for two more and he was like, two more. Like he's never <laughs> seen people eat that much in one sitting. Yeah. And, he, you know, I, I didn't know he, he did. He barely knows English. I don't know Turkish at all. So I just gesture. I'm like, yeah, big Americans, you know, fat. And he just started laughing. And I'm oh. thinking he probably told his whole family about these two big American dudes who cleared the house of pasta. Cause at the <laughs> end of the night, last day, they had no more pasta left. I think we ate it all, <laughs> <laughs> but we, we did blow it up and we, you know, we were, we, I was, I didn't lose that much body weight when it came to travel. I was mostly, it was mostly water because it was so hot there. And the AC, you know, central air is a luxury that we take for granted in the States. Because when you go to a place that only has these little standalone units in the corner of the room. Yeah. And they stop working when there's a bunch of people in the audience and stuff. Like, you really take, you really appreciate that we have central air in our venues here in the States. Yeah. I mean, so so many of these places, like Turkey is like one of the oldest places in the world. And so sometimes it's just not feasible. Sometimes it's like they get cool nights and stuff. They open their windows. And, they they do get cool nights. You know, I have like to that. say that nighttime was so nice because you have the ocean yeah. breeze coming in from the Mobaran Sea and it's 70 degrees out. It was really nice. Yeah. But daytime sucked. Yeah, exactly. So that's just like a, a cultural thing that you got to get yeah. used to. So were you there? Did you get there like super far in advance? I seem to remember you got there pretty early. Uh, I flew with the team flights. I was I got in on yeah. Tuesday. Okay. I think Tuesday. I don't remember. I got in approximately, I think like four days before I competed. I got there four okay. days out. Okay. So and I left. Crazy. No, I don't want to be at venues too long before. I actually thought that four days was too long away before I competed because I got stir crazy by day three. Okay. Like everyone on the team was competing and I'm like, God, I want to lift already. And I, like, I kind of missed that like mental point yeah. where I'm like, I need to compete now. So when I did open worlds, I scheduled it. So I only had three days, which I mean, was perfectly, it was perfectly fine. It was, I had enough time to adjust to jet lag and be ready to compete. And I wasn't just lingering there, but Denmark was head and shoulders above Turkey. The venue was so nice. It was brand new. It was like this sports arena slash concert hall thing that they had 
and nice. it was connected to a brand new hotel and the hotel room was so nice like night and day from turkey turkey i felt like i was walking into like a hotel it was a five-star hotel at one point but probably like 40 years ago in like 1980 <laughs> yeah. you know like yeah, the, yeah. The, it was dingy the halls were really short and the lighting was really like you know the only lighting they had were like these blue mood lights that you have in your room oh, that's wow. the only lighting they had in the halls it was kind of creepy i'm like the first thing I said when I walked in here is like, ah, this is like a sex club or something. This is weird, <laughs> you know, but you have to learn to get used to the less mm-hmm. than ideal venues because you're rarely going to get these gemstones like Denmark was. Yeah. You know, Let's most of the time in a minute. worlds is like mid. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially like you said, junior worlds. I mean, that's a major difference between open worlds and junior worlds. And, and they didn't have like a last minute change of venue for open worlds have been on the calendar and everything like that. So um, it's probably, you know, going to be a little more a premier event anyway. Yeah. But um, tell us also like about the team kind of environment that it was in Turkey. It seemed like everyone who went, so first of all, did anyone miss flights? Cause that's the thing. If you, if you're the, if you're getting there four days in advance and you don't miss any flights and not, no delays, no nothing, no luggage delays, no nothing like that, then it's, then it probably everything goes smooth with the travel. Then it seems like too long, but if you just miss one flight, like leaving Denver, you're two hours delayed or something like that, then boom, there's a day off, you know, off the travel in and, and now you'll have three days. So it could yeah, be it's a delicate balance. Did anyone have, did anyone have uh like bad travel experience or anything like that? Cause I know, didn't you guys no. all book together? We did the teams booked through a travel agent and, you know, I, I reluctantly went with the team flights cause I didn't feel like booking my own way there and figuring out logistically how to get, they're yeah. enjoying the team. Yeah. So I did with the team flight. I only booked the Houston leg to, to Istanbul and I booked my own flight from Denver to Houston to just meet them there. Okay. But the only thing that really occurred on my end was a two hour delay out of Houston to Istanbul. So it wasn't a connecting flight. It was the flight into Istanbul that was <clears throat> delayed, which is thankfully the one that was delayed. Okay. You know, and you guys got direct from Houston. Yeah. That's and the, the flight that left the day before us had a medical emergency on board. They had to turn around. But as far as that's concerned, the most of the problems happened on the flight there. And I usually plan my layovers um, mm-hmm. to be very long. Yeah. Especially if exactly. I'm connecting because I don't yeah. want to miss a flight because I anticipate delays happening with air yeah. travel. Um, so I don't want to be in too much of a rush or just outright miss my flight. Exactly. You know, especially if I'm trying to get to worlds, but thankfully there was no delays that messed that up. It was just delayed going into Turkey, which, you know, who cares? Well, I mean, so, that's pretty cool. You got a travel agent. The team had a travel agent. They basically yes. handled that whole aspect for you guys. And mm-hmm. it was nice because Istanbul has direct flights from a lot of major U.S. airports and stuff like that. So people could go direct. Yeah. And then you don't have to worry about getting possibly like missing a flight, a layover somewhere in Europe or something like that, you know. Um, I know that yeah. going to South Africa and going to Malta, these places are places where you're going to have to lay over somewhere in, in Europe, most likely. Um, and that adds in like another element of where something can go wrong, you know, so. Yeah, laying over in Europe is what I had to do for Denmark. But yeah. on the subject of Turkey, everything was pretty good without a hitch on our end. Everyone with the team got there okay. Everyone on the team did well. So yeah. there was nothing, there was nothing really wrong when it came how, to that how was it i team, saw how was the team aspect of you know being on team usa on the going to equipped junior worlds um and then how did that compare versus like you know how it was in uh denmark did you lose me for a minute you there i lost your audio bro yeah you cut out for a second oh sorry oh, we good yeah i'm good hear me? yeah so did you hear my question about like sort of the team dynamic um how how did it feel like at in turkey how was the vibe like amongst the team um the vibe amongst the team was i mean if you were amongst the covington kids it was fine it was Uh actually pretty cool but but being an outsider it was a little bit weird for me and for luke who was another one of the people who they sent outside of the covington because most of the subs and juniors that we sent were either the Covington kids or like in that diaspora in Louisiana. Yeah. Um, Louisiana, Mississippi. Like I, yeah. Cause I know Chandler's not Covington. Alex Chavez was in Covington. Um, and then Luke and I weren't Covington. We were from completely different States. 
So it was a little bit weird for me because I have no idea who these people are. I'm just now meeting them. Uh And it it honestly felt like I was chaperoning a high school trip. It didn't feel like (laughs) I was actually part of the team. Because you felt like you're like one of the adults. You're one of the older people. I I guess. I mean, like most of them were subs. Mm -hmm. Uh, They were in their teens, like, you know, high school, junior, senior. I think the youngest was this 15 year old girl in the 84 plus that we had. But Luke and I were like the two people. Well, and then Alex Chavez were the two that like the three of us were in our 20s with, you know, Chavez and myself being in our last year as a junior. Mm-hmm. So it was like, I'm like, I'm one of the old men at the, at the meet, you know, like it was weird. That's funny. And then fast forward, like Denmark had to be like the opposite, right? You were like the It child was the opposite. Of- I actually liked the vibe in Denmark better because okay. I, I was breaking bread with the VI and the, us team you know we had james mm-hmm. jeff we had jeff douglas we had um the, i was talking a lot you know at the breakfast buffet with the rodox ian and gene and and joe and all these guys and i really like that atmosphere better mike, mike z, z was there z too there. Yeah, yeah i wasn't really i mean mike z saved my ass in denmark because he white lighted my third bench even though there was downward motion <laughs> <laughs> and at the at, and at no this corruption. point yeah no let's no he you know i i said i would say there was down it was a shaky bench you could argue that the bar didn't go all the way down okay so it was fine but mike z and was it a two to one again no it was three whites okay thank god thank god if it was a two to one i would have been out because gaston was pissed because gaston Uh, saw downward mike didn't see downward and that was the end of it Oh, and the wow, other two judges whites. were so focused on my ass coming off the bench that they didn't even look at the bar. So I was lucky. There you, you go. Know. Nice. But yeah, so getting back to like kind of the vibe, like being the young guy on the, you know, there was a couple of of youngsters on that team. Uh, going yes. To um, Catherine Cargill, uh, mm-hmm. Andrew's, Andrew's girl. Um, she was the youngest one on our team. She was, I think, 16 or 17 on the open team. Yeah. You know, I, Jasmine I don't know Marlo. what the deal was with the sub junior. Yeah. Jasmine pretty young. Mm-hmm. I was one of the younger ones too. On the yeah. men's side, I think I was the youngest male they sent. So, mm-hmm. you know, so what was the vibe? Like you, you said, you mentioned before, it's like, the, it's more chill. you were hanging out with a lot of USVI lifters as well. Yes. Where because you didn't, most ha- you of- didn't have that at in Turkey. no i didn't have the usvi you know brotherhood that we do, do at opens because all the open lifters that i know who were in usapl when the split occurred and the suspension occurred they went to vi and they had to stay with vi for a year because of all the world games shenanigans so they were doing worlds in 2022 as a vi but these are the equipped lifters that i know these are the equip lifters I've been talking to for a long time. Yeah. So it was definitely. These are the Americans. Uh, These are the dominant yes, it Americans. Was a de- yeah, they're the Americans, you know, Virgin Islands, whatever. Yeah. But we're basically the same team, um, same people from the same country. And it was definitely a better atmosphere for me because I'm not just now meeting these people who are just random kids that I've never met. Although a lot of them are cool. Like, you know, shout out Chase. Shout yeah. out Chandler. So like- you know. Getting back to that, do you guys do you have like a little bit of a bond like with the people that you a little to bit with to Turkey with? Yes, yeah, a couple inside jokes too. You know, like with Chase, I talk about my CPAP machine all the time because like I pack my CPAP <laughs> machine to go to work. <laughs> you yeah. know, that's part of being a super heavyweight. You know, not a lot of other weight classes get that struggle of bringing your CPAP machine. Yeah, you know, I put it in my backpack, which is a huge mistake. When I went to Denmark, I, I carried it in a separate case and they let you do that because it's a medical device and okay. everything is good. But I was just paranoid, like they're not going to let me carry it that way on Turkey. So, you know, I don't know what the deal was with Turkish Airlines, but it was fine. I did it okay. in Lufthansa and they didn't say anything. So nice. Nice. Yeah. These are little travel tricks. I mean, people that are listening to this, like if you're an equipped lifter, super heavy, something like this, thinking about how to travel with the CPAP, like hit up Zen on Instagram, give some, it is, I'm saying it right now to everybody. It is legally classified as a medical device and it is excluded from your carry on limit. And in the United States and the EU, they're pretty uniform with the rules. So on Lufthansa, it's the same as United or American. But if you're traveling in the U.S. especially, they can't say anything about it. So you it know, can just, be your third carry-on is what you're saying. It can be your third carry-on. You don't have to put it in with the rest of your stuff because you're already tight on space trying to pack all your gear and your wraps and your belt and your clothes 
So, you know, you don't want to check in, in your gear. I only check in yeah. backup gear. So, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Only equip lifters have to worry about that anyway. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, raw lifters, like I could do a raw meat out of a backpack. Although you it's, know, it's a knee sleeves are beginning to be a pain in the ass to travel. Yes. With. Uh, they're cool. Well, it depends on me. what sleeves you use. Yeah, they're cool for are me. Are you using the TKS? I can, I can use them as padding for like camera gear and stuff like this. Right. So, so it's yeah, like, definitely. It's, kind of, it's like that neoprene, but like yeah. these new stiff knee sleeves are getting more and more ridiculous. They take the up more space than luggage, make, I can tell you. Yeah, the ones that Titan makes. Now I'm seeing a lot of videos where they're putting like 20 kilo, 25 kilo plates on the, the sleeves and not buckling. Yes. I'm like, if I put, Where's... if I put a 25 kilo plate on my squat suit, it's going to crumple. Yeah. So no I don't know where this is coming <laughs> from. You know, I have not worn these sleeves. I don't, they, they probably definitely do add pounds because yeah. I'm comparing them to like the Ergo pros are like this. These yeah. the A7s and the Stoics are making these new stiff sleeves. So yeah. A lot of people are raw, I think, are jumping on the equipped bandwagon with this um, stiff we were, knee sleeve. We were in the travel tips uh, part of the podcast. <laughs> and I think now almost like wraps are almost like easier to travel with in some ways. Yeah, it's, it's interesting yeah. to see how I segue that whole knee yeah. sleeve discussion <laughs> to these like new super sleeves. You know? We're not trying to start fights with raw people here, bro. We're trying no. to bring the raw crowd to, to it over and have them care and like, and that and is that what, and that's what cool. these sleeves are for. I would say, yeah. yeah. Cause that's like the <laughs> bare bones entry into like kind of equipped lifting. Cause these sleeves yeah. are going to add weight and you're going to like having this tight thing around your knees. that helps you lift a lot. Yeah. And then you're going to get wraps. And then yeah. you're going to get the tight thing around your hips that helps you lift more the suit. You know, hopefully with these new like supportive sleeves, you get people maybe like, hmm, maybe I should try equip lifting, see what it's like. So, There's you know, a it's a double edged sword here. But as I far think, as for raw, yeah, it's kind of weird. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But so let's let's go further in, into Denmark here. So tell us, yeah. you know like you give us kind of a really good, you painted a really nice picture of like how it was, you know, coming off the yeah. plane in Turkey, how yeah. it was, you know, from the jump, like you, you knew like when the AC breaks in the car on the way to the hotel, like we're going to have some issues. How was it on the flip side in Denmark? Um, the biggest problem was that the transport that I actually paid for with my own money yeah, um, did not have my name on their list. Oh, they didn't have, they had my flight. Mm. They had a couple German t- lifters coming in on the same flight, but they didn't have me. And Joe yeah. Capolino had the same issue. And they're like, okay, we can send a car for you in like two hours. But then there's another flight with another guy coming in. I think it was Sofane Belkasir. And I'm like, you know what? Screw it. So Joe went out to the terminal. We got a cab. Uh oh. And we all crammed in a cab. It was, it was me, Joe, and Cass in the cab, and me and Joe were in the back seat, and that was our transport. And we split the fare of the cab because it was like 130 US dollars. It was pretty yeah. expensive, but the the IPF shuttle didn't show up to pick us up, so we had yeah. to get our own way there. Um, aside from that, everything was great. Like the food was phenomenal, the hotel was phenomenal, everything was like pristine. What was the food like in Denmark? Oh, it was good. They had the pastries, obviously, at the uh-huh. breakfast buffet. They had really good bacon, <laughs> really good sausage, really good eggs. Nice. They had a lot of, like, they had coffee. They had an espresso machine. They could just press a button. They would make a nice little Boom. cappuccino for you. And they had salmon. Oh, I ate a ton of salmon. And then they ran out of salmon because everyone was eating the salmon. But they had the salmon, <laughs> and that was so good. Versus the breakfast buffet in Turkey, yeah, where they had like these Nescafe powder, like little uh-huh. powdered containers of instant yep. coffee, and you go to like the office water cooler to fill a little cup and then stir it, and the cups are like that small, like, and yeah. the eggs were water. Like I ate one serving of eggs. That's... I didn't eat eggs the rest of the time because it was so watery. It was like powdered eggs or something. That's such a shame, bro. Because I think Turkey's known for having like really good coffee. Yeah, uh... but they screwed it up. Yeah, it was at the low hotel, budget. Obviously, they didn't. You know, do and there was actually it. one time where the breakfast buffet at Turkey had onion rings, <laughs> and they were like great like, value onion Americans, rings. They're eating us out of everything. Just give them onion rings. You know, we were eat- we were eating them out of house at home, and like the selections became more and more squalid as the meat went on. I couldn't imagine what the raw side of things were. <laughs> 
because they had twice as many people, including an overflow yeah. hotel, which I heard was better than the one we were in. So, you know, that's hilarious that like um, you guys ate them out of like what they expected to serve. So then they just started serving like stereotypical like American things like fries and onion rings. <laughs> yeah. At breakfast. You know, we don't <laughs> typically eat this for breakfast. You know, yeah, yeah. they had these like beef sausages like in this like kind of like red sauce. I don't know what it was. It was pretty nice, though. It was actually the protein yeah. source of breakfast because the eggs were absolutely inedible. And they wow. did have a good dinner buffet. They had some like chicken, like pulled chicken, because you know, culturally they don't really do pork. Okay. Um, some carb options, like they had like fries, obviously, because you know, they had a bunch of Westerners there. They didn't know what else to feed them. And they yeah. had baklava, and the baklava hit really good. The baklava, the baklava situation was great because yeah. baklava comes from Turkey. So, you know, if they fuck yeah. that up, we're really in bad, we're really in a bad situation. With the I'm kind of shocked to hear about this coffee situation. I thought like everything. No, the coffee bad. situation was better in Denmark than Turkey. They had little Nescafe packets in Turkey and that was your Those coffee. Nescafe things are no good. No, they're not. Um, and, but okay. So in Denmark, everything is nice. It's immaculate. You're, you're yes. hanging out as a team. You feel like you've got a squad of like, serious hitters behind you like joe cap yep. and the other americans like new well, and everyone. joe didn't talk to me before the meet but you know yes oh really we didn't re- yeah get into that he, he, why because he's your you competitor know, no obviously not not yet yeah. it was just because he it was you know it was supposedly his last worlds and mm. he just wanted to be left alone before the meet and he didn't want to really talk to me before the meet you know he didn't want to be bothered okay. so he just you know I left him alone and he left me alone and we were fine. And then the night before the meet, he came up, asked me how I was doing, how I was feeling. I said, I was feeling good. And he's like, good. You know, you're going to smoke shit tomorrow. Everything will be fine. Mm-hmm. You know? And then he introduced me to Gaston, which was interesting. I was waiting in line for a sandwich at the, the venue bar. They have a little like food bar, drink yeah. bar at the, um, a concession stand, if you would, at the right behind the venue, like where you're spectating, you walk out and there's this little bar. That's so it was awesome. really nice. I ate a ton of these egg and what are they, egg and mayo sandwiches. I just ate a shit ton of those. I probably ate like 20 of them. I weighed That's in heavy ass. too, but I was bloated and I was ready. So it was good. I love that they had a concession stand with like decent food and drinks. They had adult beverages there, like beer. They had beer. They had booze. I didn't partake in the booze until after the meet, yeah. but they had booze and they had That's water, awesome. soft drinks. You know, it was nice. That makes it feel like a little bit more like a spectator sport, you know, like when yes. it's like that old, like going to a baseball game thing. It's like, it's just not right. If you don't have like a beer and a hot dog in your hand, you know, stuff like that. Right. Definitely. And like the only difference is, you know, you actually have to go to the bar to get the food yeah and a lot of people when they were doing a 20 minute break for bench you know a 20 minute break for deadlift they all piled up and lined up at the bar you know so it was during openers you got to go during openers bro. yeah you have to go during openers it was it was definitely a different experience it felt more like a sport and to my knowledge i think the meat director um really partnered with that particular town in denmark because the mayor um was an olympic handball athlete and he wants okay. to bring sports to the town, you know. So he, the mayor wanted it, the powerlifting world championships to be in this really nice big venue. And, you cool. know, they were advertising everything except us on the screens <laughs> outside the venue. But, you know, like yeah. it, it was a nice venue. Yeah. Yeah. And it looked it looked like it was cool. It looked like there was a crowd and like it was people were cheering and like it was like a little bit more of a raucous environment than what I think you would yeah. typically see at uh, Classic Worlds, you know. Yeah. Classic Worlds gets pretty turned i mean the 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 raw lifting side of things i think the real energy came from sheffield yeah yeah but in my opinion when raw lifters see sheffield they're kind of seeing what we've already been having in equipped and that brings me to this little argument on why equip should be watched okay do it we have the world games mm-hmm. and the world games happens every four years it's like our Olympics mm-hmm. in powerlifting and there's an opening ceremony with like 50,000 people there. And then the, we're in a big concert hall, just like the Sheffield venue was yeah. where you have like a symphony hall with tiered seats all the way up to like 60 feet above where you're lifting. And it's packed for the last few sessions when all the big boys are lifting, the big girls are lifting. You just see the whole audience packed and you're lifting in this grand stadium and you're seeing a side of equipped lifting that's truly technical master mastery mm-hmm. 
It's not like what people, when they think of equipped lifting, they're thinking of all these multiply West side barbell diaper yeah, suit yeah. squats. They're not thinking of people who walk their weights out and have to hit the same depth as raw lifters, same bench standards, same deadlift standards. It's IPF. And it's poetry yeah. in the equipment. You can't move like shit in single ply. Yeah. You actually have to be very attuned to your gear. You're going to look like a flopping fish on the platform, you know? So that's why I think equipped should be watched because it brings – not only is it historically the foundation of powerlifting and built the groundwork for what we have today in our sport, totally. it's just like seeing people who are learning to become one with something that isn't part of their body to lift the most amount of weight possible. And I think that should, in my opinion, attract spectators, especially, you know. Absolutely. I mean, I was just watching uh, replays of it and replays of 2021 uh, equipped worlds as well. And both of them, the crowds looked like they were pretty serious. And obviously world games, we saw like everything from the opening ceremony through just the platform itself. I mean, in a way it was, it was kind of Sheffield before Sheffield, like you said, it was in a similar type of uh, theater type of an environment with a stage where the, the lifting is taking place up on stage and everything. So yeah, that's really exciting. Um, that's that's definitely a good pitch for the if you're gonna tune in, like go watch the uh, World Games from Birmingham or go watch this most recent Worlds, uh, Open Equip Worlds in Denmark. Go ahead. Especially the A groups because we had the same thing with the tiered seatings and mm -hmm. kind of it was on a it wasn't on a stage but it was at the bottom of like this sports arena where everything yeah. tiered upwards and the the seats. I was in the audience in the A group because I lifted in the B group for the super heavyweight. Uh, men and 84 women the audience was packed it was full mm -hmm. they had overflow standing on the balconies behind where the seats were it was it was full so yeah. it was like Sheffield before Sheffield yeah you know? Denmark I've heard um that this world was just one of the best across the board like the equipment was. the warm-up rooms like everything was taken care of the venue was immaculate the hotels were good um, the food was amazing. Like everyone I've talking to, I've spoken to that has been there. They're like, this is the one, yeah. like I'm kind yeah, of kicking myself had... that I didn't go. I should have pushed harder to get, to to go with team PA, but we only had, how many lifters do we have on that team? And I was just I looking think... this up, like U S finished in fifth place on team points. Wow. That's something to sneeze at, especially yeah. in open. No. Um, and let me make sure this is the right. Is this. This is and that's yeah, like a that's a down year. We don't this have is people. Yeah, that's what I was gonna is... say. So, so um, fifth place is like first. I mean, that's weird for some people who who like only pay attention on the raw side. They don't expect like the men's team to come in fifth place. It's more common and equipped because there are heavy hitters like Ukraine in here yep. who like wow they like blew everyone away they had 60 points and then the second place was yeah, 42 they got 12 12 12 and 12 yeah yeah exactly they got all the all 12s and then and then and then it's pretty tight grouping from there on um i was kind of surprised to see that virgin islands only beat the u.s by like three points so maybe if you had made a couple we extra, had good we had benches. good people no, I'm just joking <laughs> you know yeah actually funny enough like not just benches but squats a couple of my squats yeah. were good lifts that were overturned by the jury you know, all in all, I could have gotten, I would have edged out third because you Carlos Murillo, yes. Holy shit. It would, have, it would have been more likely, especially, you know, I mean, I would have gotten fourth or third because Campos Murillo bombed out on bench. So that just uh -huh. opened up wide. If you yeah. actually look at the results, the and third Willow, place guy was this German dude who totaled a thousand ten. So, you know, you never know what's going to happen at Worlds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He would you say that he was the highest on nominations? No, he was probably in the middle of the group on nominations. Okay. You know, that's yeah. So that's the funny it, thing. Someone bombs out or together. fucks up he, and you have... he went eight for nine. Homie yeah. from Germany went eight for nine. Yeah, and, and uh, that's when that's when I really looked at myself and realized, you know, I have to be more consistent. Well, well not just what, the standards, but the it's, lifts. It's this thing of like the the guys who beat him so first place guy from Ukraine missed two lifts that's pretty good seven seven for nine I think in the uh, Matt Gary book that came out it says like seven point four out of nine is usually what world champions at IPF worlds and I'm not, that might be classic so if you make seven or eight lifts you make eight lifts you're doing better than on average what the world champions are going to be doing so that's pretty good um, second place guy missed four lifts though so that guy oh <laughs> Joe Joe Cap 
<laughs> that was Joe Cap. Uh, I mean, damn dog. Imagine if he hit like he left a lot of attempts out there on the table, especially on on bench, mission his last deadlift. Um, these totals could be a lot higher. His last deadlift was a pretty tough one too, because he made it. And he, he got, got the down there. command and he pulled it was he made it, but he got two reds on lockout. He mm-hmm. stood it all the way up. And you know, we all thought he was gonna win mm-hmm. because that was for the win. And we were cheering, we were cheering our lungs out. It was the energy was insane. Uh-huh. And then when the two reds came out, there was a collective yeah, was- oh in the whole audience, it was insane. He would have won by two I mean, and a half kilos. Yeah, Joe Cap, he you know, he took it in grace, you know. Of course. He, I mean he gave uh, me that belt, by the way, that he laid on the awesome. platform. Are and you then the checks. Uh, yeah, I've been wearing it the whole time since. You awesome. know, after the war after Worlds was over, after the banquet was done, we were in the hotel lobby at Peak because you know, we all we're all supposed to leave the next morning. So I know that I'm only gonna sleep like three hours, four yeah. hours, hang out and then night. get back down with my luggage and go. So yeah. we were sitting in the hotel lobby at the peak 12 and, you know, he's like, do you want my belt? And I'm like, you know, if you want to give me your belt, I can take your belt. You know, like so he was, so he, he had Cass go up and get it. And he came, we, she came back down and I had it and I put it on and it fit fucking perfectly and it felt insane. Wow. You know, so I, he gave me his belt and so- I've been wearing it in training ever since. And I will be wearing it at nationals, the belt that, I have currently is his was his he passed it to me wow man that is an awesome story like you go on to do big things like Joe Cap did um wow the, like the passing the torch on to the next generation that's really cool is he's been such yep. a great mentor and he's done a lot for the sport you know I, I went and listened to some of the spicy PL podcasts that he had going and uh, I want to get him on here I want to get him on here with you and you guys to run a whole equipped uh series of shows and stuff on here we will talk about that later but um he's a great guy i met him in Absolutely. orlando he helped me out like pointed out all the lifters i should be paying attention to from a social media standpoint and whatnot um but yeah man it's only like damn though if if he like you said he's missing four lifts if he could have made another bench or two you know he, he could have won that he could have won that you know with ease um because like you said he pulled his last lift he pulled his last deadlift. That was to win for two and a half kilos, uh, win it, to win it by two and a half kilos, um, which he would have needed because he, the guy weighed in significantly lighter than him. So yeah, that, that's a shame that, I mean, but what do you think? Like, is he coming back? Is he coming to PA? What's, what's going to happen with Joe cap? Well, I'm sending him one of my belts to XL SPD belt. Nice. So we're even. Um, that kind of ruins the torch passing story, but it kind of doesn't because he's no. down in body weight significantly. He's okay. in the three forties. I think he's like three forty two now. He's like thirty pounds lighter than he was at Worlds this wow. past year. So he's dropped a lot of body weight. He, I'm pretty sure he intended to retire and intends to stay retired, but he's getting coaxed back, from what I know. Okay, good. James wants him. I mean, and plus he's we all want him. But because of the way that Carpinos are and excuse me, the way the nominations are this year, it actually allows people who competed at worlds to apply their total and alternate pool from that year's from last year's worlds. Okay. And, you know, and that way his total is in the mix for the alternate pool and it's way higher than mine and it's above Carpino. So that's why nationals is so crucial for me because mm-hmm. if I don't hit Carpino five, at nationals i'm not guaranteed to go back james might still send me but it's not like you're set you're going to lithuania you, so you would make it you would have to make it through the alternate pool then as yes it would be automatic. i would be stuck in alternate pool my goal is to total <clears throat> carpino five or better at open nationals in june mm-hmm. to seal it because looking at the current roster of super heavyweights i don't see anyone beating me overall in total yet okay um, in the open world to you're talking open worlds or or open nationals? Nationals. Nationals. Okay. Gotcha. There's no one currently on there yet who can do anything um to my to where I'm currently at with my total. Um, so I really just want to hit that Carpino five and lock it in. Okay. That's Perfect. my goal. There's a lot of YOLO lifts I'm thinking about and have thought in my head and like played out these scenarios and be hitting these huge lifts, but I'm like, 
just get Carpino five and run with just, it. You have five yes. months after that to show it at Lithuania. Exactly. Exactly. You, know. you got time. You just do it on the right stage. Absolutely. Do it when it counts. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> That's good to have that goal. And maybe you lock it in on your second deadlift or something. And, and then you can yell. Yeah, you know, exactly. You know. So if you earn it, Absolutely. you got to earn that though. First. Um, no, so you have to earn YOLO deadlifts. So he's not coming to uh, Scottsdale then. He will be coaching. Oh, okay. So he'll be there. Yes. But uh, he will not numbers, be competing. His number is technically there, I guess. Um, yes. he James will allow him to apply his world's total from last year to okay, our cool. alternate pool, even though yeah, he was technically he VI. Yeah. I want to see him come back. You know, I'm sending him a belt so he, 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 he can actually train with something that fits him better, you know, because he's training with this prong belt right now <clears> that he probably had laying around. You know, because you got it. Good seeing belt. him, seeing him lift now <laughs> versus seeing him lift back then. I mean, I want to, I want to see him come back, but I don't know how good he'll be in year because he ain't three seventy anymore. He ain't the growth god. Like yeah, I mean that's so fine. It's a, it's a new era for him. You know, yep. his deadlift will probably go up. I mean, who knows? His probably squat, maybe his you know. to get a new squat suit probably a new bench shirt. He'll have to get tighter shit. But then again, yeah. you can always get back to where you are. I mean, you're probably not going to hit the thousand pound squats or whatever, or like the 750, mm-hmm. 760 benches, but you get tired of shit. You can just keep going. He looks like Tony Harris right now. He's jacked. Yeah. He's yeah. going to come out lean and mean, man. He's going to look cool. So I want to see him awesome. compete again. You know, if it's not at nationals, hopefully they send him and myself as the open super heavyweights for worlds. That'd be good to see. Wouldn't that be, you fun? know, they want, I mean, I'm <clears> looking <throat> at the roster right now and I'm thinking, you know, with the men's side of things, I'm not sure we have Alex Mayer on there. He wasn't there last year. Um, we have a couple other people that I saw that were on there that weren't there last year. So hopefully we'll send a good eight, eight, men and women to go Mm -hmm. oh definitely this year it's happening so all right let's quickly let's wrap up the denmark story then let's get into this this discussion about like who's coming and and nationals a little bit a little taste of a nationals preview because we're gonna have you back on and do a full-on equipped nationals preview show okay so and we're gonna bring other people on like we can bring joe on or whoever else wants to come um i'll let you you know help help pick out who those people are and, but so, so tell us the story about your actual lifting and how that all went down in Denmark. Cause so far we just really yeah. talked about, you know, stuff that happened in the lobby and like uh, the food and stuff like that. But yes, <laughs> but the lifting, um, I was in the B group. Okay. Which was horrible. You finished, you finished six. So I got I was six. Surprised. Yes. That's nothing to sneeze at. That's three places above my nominated, which was ninth. Yeah. Um, but still the seven person flight was a different experience in Turkey. I had a full flight 14. Okay. I think it was like 13 or 14. So I had, I definitely had more time to recuperate Okay. in Denmark. We was, we was running seven people and we had the check loaders and they're fast. Mm. So basically I was getting off the platform, getting blood back in my legs. I'm back getting wrapped again. It was pretty fast. And I was like, you know, Damn. I can't make excuses about these things. Cause we're going to have meets that run this fast all the time. This yeah. is IPF. This is it. Man. So I made my first squad at 390. I got two reds. One of which oh. was for a yellow card and the yellow oh. card got the jury to overturn it. So oh. I, I got it credited to me but now they're really looking at my depth because the other card was for depth yeah and second and third at 410 we all know what happened i got two white lights and yeah. both of them were overturned by the jury to no lifts so what and go into that like what exactly happened like the jury just stepped in and said no there's yes even though you got, no one came and challenged or anything like that no one contested nobody okay. contested the jury made the decision themselves because they're allowed to do that. If they think there's a mistake in the ruling, they can do that. Okay. So if they think it's yes. egregious, I believe is, is like there's language in the, in the rule book about if they think it's egregious. Um, yeah. But now they have video. So and that was they may have looked at the instant replay and thought it was high okay. and decided to overturn it. Okay. I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, there was no other team coaches that were at the jury table with a hundred bucks. So no one was trying to get me, you know, they, they'd be stupid too. I'm you, not in the top contention. That. You don't see that a lot in like 
you know, people who are nominated ninth in the B group, you know, a lot of um, challenges to the, so that's very interesting that the jury would over overturn. We've seen the IPF juries. I mean, this was in, when was this like in November? Um, and, you know, we obviously saw that it was the, at Bonica, the, the IPF Bonica jury getting, at world, world games was rough. Bonica got I mean, getting screwed. Jesus, yes. Jesus kind of got hit in, at, in South Africa. Well, the referees. Then, oh no, that, did he get any lifts overturned by the jury in South Africa? Because I don't think he did. I think he just got him red lights from the start. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they well then they then they didn't help him out. They didn't give him give it back. Yeah. Yes. The judging is pretty tough. Yeah. You know, uh, some would say. You I know, saying, I don't want to air out my laundry, of course, with IPF when I'm competing in IPF. It's a little yeah. bit harder against Americans. It's kind of like the elephant in the room. Even at Euros, so, the, it seemed like I, I, on the raw side, there was a lot of talk about Euros, like refing was like super intense as well, like yes. super strict. And then obviously World Games, we saw the the jury, the whole question of the jury being a little bit uh, overzealous. Like kinda, They were very active throughout the whole meet. They yeah. overturned another lifter we had in the 69s A group. Um, she had two of her squats overturned and she only made her third, mm. you know. They were what I was seeing was that the jury was get was looking at the video right after the squad and immediately overturning it. Okay, there was no contesting, so that's probably what happened here. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a five man jury for that session, a three man for mine, and I oh. think I was kind of hit because my session wasn't being broadcast on the Olympic Channel. Mm -hmm. I think when the when the when the sessions are being broadcast on TV, they're a little bit less overzealous because they know that there's like a crowd of people in the millions watching it yeah. on TV yeah, and they don't understand the semantics of powerlifting enough to know what a jury overturn means. Yeah. So they're, they were doing it less. They were doing it's it a less standard frequently. kind of thing you see, like even in football, like in bigger games, like, or even in NBA, they say like, let them play a little bit more. Yeah. People don't want to see it's, it's not entertaining to see a bunch of yellow flags on the football field, you know, and the game is right. constantly getting stopped. And it's, I think, even though it's, there's probably not like an IPF memo that says, Hey, let's call it a little easier when Euro Euro sport is uh broadcast. There probably the isn't, but the jury is but, a little bit less active for that yeah, reason. Exactly. It's a subconscious you know, thing. It's a little bit of a subconscious thing. You know, they were very active in a lot of the sessions at open worlds, though, and that was of common observation. Yeah. Uh, I got hit with it. And I think that I let it was partially my fault because my opening squat was not perfect. They were looking at it more after that. The jury was more screwed. They were more, since they already gifted me my opener, but they thought it was probably not good. What I, what I heard was that the side referee in that session was very new and mm -hmm. they overturned it because he red lighted the wrong, he didn't red light it correctly or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, cause I got a yellow infraction card when nothing lined up with a yellow card, gotcha. nothing, so you know, the red card, you it. could argue that it was high, but I didn't move. Like I didn't jump a command. Everything was fine. Yeah. So what really did me in was the fact that I left it open the right off the gate. Yeah. And that's exactly. tying back into making attempts. You also have to look good at first. <laughs> Cause if you go out there and just sink the squat, you're not going to be scrutinized as much in the next couple squats you do. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was also on me. You know, it That's, sucks that the jury got involved. A lot of the people thought that the second squat shouldn't have been overturned. And the third one was just a little bit more borderline. And I kind of trust that ruling. So, you know, yeah. I had to wash it away. I was internally, I was pissed, yeah. but you know, I can't keep that mindset throughout the whole me. I just, just like try to wash it away and start benching. That's that's on sports, the bench. Man. Like, well, real yep. quick on this. I mean, like it's, it's, that's, that's being an athlete and you have to adapt. Yeah. You have to play the refs. Like you see this in basketball all the time. Like they mm -hmm. play to how the refs are calling it. You know, if they're letting them get away with stuff, they're going to get away with it. Absolutely. If they're, not, if they're not letting them get away, they're going to clean it up. Like, and you can, you can, you know, certain refs are going to call certain things. Like it was famously like Kobe, LeBron, Jordan, yep. they would get, we have someone know, get foul calls. They know how to go in and get a foul call if necessary, how to play the ref, you know? Yeah. And then, so same thing in powerlifting. It's like, like you said, they're there. Maybe you take a little off on your opener to make it look super clean and perfect to the standard so that they're not holding you to extra scrutiny on your second and thirds. And that's part of right. the, that's one strategy for that's dealing with definitely a strategy. Um, there's also specific referees that we know are harder. Yeah. So when they're on the platform and you see their name on that list, you will have to do a little bit more. And that's scouting. 
You know, that is scouting. We, knowing, we, your, I've, knowing your refs. I know who's I, – I try to figure out who's refing my session so I know who's going to be on there, read the room a little bit. Yeah. You know, I – but when the IPF is involved and I'm at the world stage, I definitely – like reading the refs is just like make everything perfect because yep. they're not going to – they're not going to let you get away with anything here. And if they do, the jury won't. So, yeah, be perfect. Yeah. Three whites. That's you know, universal. In, universal. As an athlete, though. Yeah. Yeah, go on. No, I would say that that's like that's a tip that applies to anyone going into an IPF. Right. Like raw, raw you know, or equipped. Universally speaking, yes. But as an athlete, I have to watch these things away when they happen. So on to bench. Yeah. <laughs> With the bench, I hit my opener. I bobble it all over the fucking place. I got a red from downward. I got a red from Titty Mike. It was that bad. Uh You know, so like, I'm like, oh, fuck. So we retook it. We kind of like, I think, I don't know if we really did any adjustment with the shirt, except just try to be more aggressive and stable with it. And like, you know, James sent me back out there again. And this time I pressed it out just fine. My ass came off the bench. So two reds. So now I'm in the same position I was in Turkey. Yeah. You know, and you just missed four lifts in a row. Yeah. Typically. <laughs> yes. On paper, I missed four lifts in a row. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> here we go for a third one. And I know it's bad because James pulled me aside, put his hands on my shoulder and prayed over me. Wow. Because, you know, if, it, if you know, he's a praying man and I appreciate yeah. that, you know, and he, he prayed over it because, you know, I'm about to bomb out on bench, you know, like, you know, he wanted to make sure that yeah. it wouldn't happen through divine intervention or not that I don't miss. So I go out there. I bring it down. He just told me to flex my ass as hard as I can. And it doesn't come up. And, you know, because like when I'm when I have an equipped bench. I have a little bit of a shaky butt coming down because, you know, I'm trying to keep my my chest up as much as possible. And I'm really driving my feet down into the ground to keep my chest up. So my ass kind of shakes a bit. So that was why they were looking at it. But I was trying to keep it as still as possible. Then I got the press command and I come up and the bar kind of like went a little bit wonky and I finished it. And I felt that I'm like, there's no way in hell I don't get one red for downward. Mm-hmm. I get up and I stare at the, the screen Three whites comes up and oh. this time I'm actually doing the, because yeah. I thought I, I, you know, with the jury that we had, I wouldn't have had that. Yeah. And I, I went back into the, you know, to start warming up for deadlifts. And what I heard from people in the audience was that, um, you know, Mike, Mike Z was approached by Gaston, who was not pleased with what the decision <laughs> was. Um, he had it out for you. Bro. And the jury was actually gesturing downward. They were like doing the whole like to say there was downward, but they couldn't do anything. They're powerless to three whites, you know, and for and yes. as a referee, you're calling it in the moment. And in the moment, you probably just saw it unevenly bobble, but not go down. Yeah. So, you know, if That's you watch it in slow-mo be, replay, the bar may have gone down a bit. But, you know, in real time, you're looking at it, you know, if you don't have. It, tie goes to the runner that's in the rule book so exactly if it looks exactly. if it looks in eh, but you don't know give him white light and i got three whites because i don't think the other two judges were even looking at my bar at that point they were just trying to make sure my ass didn't come off the bench yeah and deadlifts were kind of underwhelming pulled 310 it's all good you know that's you one thing your, i've been working on you hit your first and your second and then miss your third yeah i was just my back was seizing up it was just you, the you went turnarounds up uh okay yeah you only you went up 15 kilos on your thing yeah to try to get a thousand kilos on the total and i missed because, because at that point i was just trying to salvage a thousand you know which because, is crazy you know, because you were in the b group so you didn't know what was happening yeah so obviously like this guy who finished right in front of you lupus yeah lupus uh, lupus yeah romania yeah romania um, he tied and he was he in your b group though no he was in the a group no he was in a group yeah, exactly. So, yep. so I was thinking when I saw this number right away, 985, 985, you guys tied and you, you only took six based on body weight. You, you basically, you tied the fifth place total, um, you know, in the heat of battle, when you've got Mike Z or you got James, I'm saying handling you and stuff, that's not going to happen. If you're going head to head and you see that happening, um, you're going to get uh, some differentiation. We're going to go, we're going to, we would have, if gonna, we, if I had known, we would have probably been at 312 or 315. We would have not yeah. done 325, yeah, you know, just exactly. to edge out my competitors as much as possible to get as many team points as possible. 
Exactly. You know? Exactly. So, cause yeah, you would have, you would have just needed anything else on the day and you would have taken effectively care. finishing top five in the world with a bad meet like that yeah. at my first open world. There's nothing to sneeze at dude. As know? a junior, so, I mean, cause as well, yeah, you're, are you still a junior now? No. Um, by age? Yes. I'm 23. Okay. By birth year? No, I'm in the open. Is that so, right? Because I think I thought you was t- okay. You would know obviously better than me, but uh, IPF you're turning 24. Birth year. You're turning I, 24 year, this year. I turned 24 this year. So I guess PA follows the same as IPF and they don't do a birthday like USAPL would have, but you know, yeah. yes. So I thought uh, it was juniors included 24 year olds. No, nope. No, it's the, 23. The la- it's the full year that you turn 23. Okay. It's the last gotcha. year you can be junior. Okay. Gotcha. And gotcha. you know, to yeah, be out man. of juniors is fine. You know? Yeah, of course. You're already in the open. The big boys. Yeah. Of course. You're, not you're already in the boys. open, but I mean, uh, it's yeah. cool to get these experiences. You know, I'm, yes. I'm happy for you that you took mm-hmm. advantage of the situation and you went to both of them. Um, yes. Because like you said, there is no more. That was your last shot at Junior Worlds. And, that, and, and this is my first shot of many at Open. Yeah, exactly. Obviously. And, you, you know, know, with the split in the federations and the USVI, I, there was really lightning in a bottle there, you know, yep. for me to be the Open contender because we didn't have many people. And I knew in my heart that the junior win was legit. Mm -hmm. I was the best equipped junior in the United States at that year. Yeah. You know, including the USAPL stuff as well. Well, you showed it by going head to head with Ray and, you know, again, having a meet where you only made four lifts and still being, you know, being very consistent, very still like, you know, being more consistent in the gear is my number one thing because I know I'm stronger than I look on paper. Yeah. I just need to demonstrate it better. Yeah, but, well, you know, I want to prove this year that my win at Nationals last year in the Opens was not a fluke mm-hmm. and that I am the Open contender for super heavyweights in the United States when it comes to equip lifting. I want to prove that I am the Open champion and that I will stay the Open champion. Yeah, I mean, because last well, year was a little <laughs> bit weird. And I admit well, that wholeheartedly that the Open win was not really a true open win because it was just you and was right that you were the only open it was me luke logan and andrew and i think a couple other people yes okay okay gotcha and i mean but you've already done a lot to prove it bro you've you know you've went out you got a silver medal at junior worlds you went you went from a 962 total in the u.s in orlando to 985 total in denmark on the biggest stage like in a shot and, a shit day too exactly i mean again hitting four lifts um going four for nine like that's so i think you've shown that there's a lot of potential there it's like we're just wait to see you put it all together and you have a yes. lot of time to do it like you know this is this is a patient man's game here you know like mm-hmm. this is something where it's like it's not a sprint it's a marathon you got plenty of time you stay patient you'll be good all right so let's talk about nationals you want to repeat you want to win You kind of already talked about your goals. You want to, you know, you want to prove that it wasn't a fluke. It wasn't just because there was no one there. Um, And then obviously you want to go back to worlds and show out, you know, get on the podium, maybe win it. What do you think? Um, I don't, I'm, I'm a very superstitious individual when it comes to the powerlifting gods. I don't want to tempt them by like saying what I want to do. Okay. Gotcha. But I believe that I have a good shot at putting up a nominated total for the A group okay. and to be in closer contention for podium in real time rather mm-hmm. than putting up a total in B group and sitting back in the audience and hoping people mess up ahead of you. Yeah, yeah. I want to be in that top five heat to try to get at least a bronze medal finish in Lithuania. If I make it, obviously, my yeah. number one goal is to hit Carpino five. Yeah. defend my title and try to add on to that total as much as possible. So I have a good nomination for a group next year. Yeah, absolutely. You want to be or in that this A-group year so, so that you can, yes. you know, be, have a final say into what, where you, so finish. I can see in real time what's going on and not have to yeah. wait in the audience. Yeah. Cause that's anxiety affect, inducing. And you can, I was watching a group. Yeah. I was watching a group. And for most of it, I was staring at the scoreboard. I wasn't staring at the lifting. I was like, yeah. where am I? Where am I? I'm now I'm in fourth, fifth, sixth. Like, yeah. okay. Six is nothing to sneeze at. And, you know, I want to improve on that result this year. Well, we talked, that's um, my main goal. You know, like I, I just did this long interview with Matt Gary. And one of the things that we talked about, you know, cause he came out with this whole book on game day coaching and strategy and all that. 
And it's like a per- person that's in your shoes. All right. So let's just be totally, you know, we're looking at the total who won last year, 1135. It's going to be difficult for you to get up to 1135 in, in a matter of a calendar year. But hey, let's say, you know, training pops off. It could happen. All right. But yeah, what is probably more likely your route to winning a world championship is going to be making a lot of lifts, putting pressure, putting up a, a, a you know, building a total lift by lift. And then Yes. them making some kind of mistake, putting the pressure on them to where they have to go nine for nine, or they have to put up as big a total as they did last year in order to beat you. Um, as opposed to where, you know, they've basically already won with their final deadlifts. There's nothing on the line, you know, because everyone else behind them missed or couldn't yeah. come close enough to challenge. So I'm trying yeah. to be a, a better pressure player and I'm, yeah. I really want to improve. I'm definitely going to go over the thousand kilo mark. Yeah, in yeah. in nationals and i have, I have stretch wood. goals yeah Great. knock on wood i don't want powerlifting gods a thousand kilos i mean yes knock on wood but a thousand kilos is pretty it's steadfast right i mean because carpino five is a thousand thirty two point five that's my minimum of what i want to hit okay bro well shit i mean that's that's i want to have kilos wanna, off of winning worlds I want a thousand thirty two point five is not it's a it's a hundred and two point five kilos away from winning wins. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, no, the Carpino five oh, yeah, eleven is eleven thirty five, not, not eleven. 000. No, um, Dude, 11 worlds. I just want to. got an insane. I want to. Yeah, Andrei Shevchenko. He is a god. You know, he's like only like three thirty, and he's squatting nine seventy, benching in the sevens, deadlifting close he's to eight. Bro. He's a very you know, and their training was very upended this year by the war. So, you know, like, yeah, it was upended going into that, though, as well. Yes, um, it was so. definitely, you know, the Ukrainian team showing out this year was great to see because of how yeah. chaotic their nation's affairs have been in 2022. Yeah. You know, for sure, for sure. Wow, dude. I mean, I was like missing a zero on this guy's total. That, know, this guy, no, he's he's close to 1200. Then, you know, that's it. But like Jesus would have won equipped world's raw which is insane to think about how big of a gap he just set for everyone else yeah you know exactly exactly but you know looking at that is you know what i really want to do is get back to worlds okay um and then tell us a little bit like give us like a little mini preview of like what we should be looking for at equipped nationals which is coming up june 4th i believe right i have the schedule pull out of the roster pulled up okay. i would try looking at it right now just a quick scan over like um, off your definitely head. pay attention okay go ahead alexis alex mayer's deadlift is going to be absurd okay. he already pulled 805 at 73 wow so wow. 365 at 73 that's un- i mean that's not an official world record um i would say greg johnson is going to be there that's going to be cool to see um Noah Johnson, the another junior phenom, is going to be great to see. Yeah, Noah Johnson. I'm not. He went to. World. I'm looking at my weight class, and I'm the only open only. There's no one else in the open only. There's like age group underneath me, so mm-hmm. you know, don't mess up. For the equipped women, we have Kimberly Johnson, IPF World Champion this last year in Denmark. She she's should, coming over. She's coming over. Kelsey McCarthy is going to come over, and she's going to put up a pretty. Solid total, I think. And Natalie Hansen is coming to PA. And I actually trained with Natalie a bit at Elevate Barbell in Fort Collins, and I've been seeing her training. And she's holding her own very well as a 76. Okay. She's going to be very good at 76. She's From what I'm seeing in her training, it looks really good. Um, obviously, there's a slight reduction in her squat and bench from when she was at 84, but she's looking very sharp at 76. So we should see something big from her as well. And, you know, that's off of what I see now. I do see some returning faces um, from junior worlds. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, Chandler Losher is going to try his hand in the open. Big Chan lifts. Yeah. yeah, 120 kilo class. Um, Dale McLaren. Yeah. I think he got fifth last year at open worlds. Uh, he's coming back. So there's a lot of returning faces from the uh, USVI side of things. But okay. looking at who's currently here, those are the ones that I'm really like highlighting. Definitely yeah. look at the Johnsons, Kimberly and Noah, mm-hmm. and 
Gregory as well, another Johnson. No relation. Gregory. No relation. Greg Johnson. Yeah. I think a lot and of then, people got familiar with him and Kelsey McCarthy um, coming out. They both came out to Austin and lifted raw. And Natalie Hansen returning to uh, the platform to try to bid for a world or world shot. She's a former world champion, two time world champion. So seeing her coming back is great. So and... the, the deadline for this is not, hasn't come yet and it's not full. Yes. So the roster currently is no. a little bit incomplete. So we'll probably do, a full on preview show like two weeks out, something like that. Um, yes. once the roster is 100%, That'd be a good idea. Who else are we expecting? Yeah. Isn't Taylor LaChapelle coming? Have you heard anything I about her? I think she might be coming over. Um, I don't know if Ian will be coming over. I don't know if Ian's really able to compete right now. I think he's trying Ian to meet prep. Ian Bell is trying, I think, but I'm not sure if he's going to come here because obviously he works out of Okinawa, so it's yeah a little bit of a flight you know i'm not sure if he'll do that or he'll just do the application of the total into the alternate pool and hope no one in his weight class gets there because or the best 105 i think right now on the roster currently is um dale mclaren i don't know any of these other ones right now and ian um i mean he would have to come and put up a total or you're saying he could count his denmark total based off of um the national team page and yeah in pa what I was looking at was, you know, That's national teams thing. equipped. Yeah. Like, you know, what it's saying is the alternate pool, all lifters who competed at IPF Open Equip World Championships previous year would be allowed to apply their total from the, the year's world championships nice. in the alternate pool. So okay. James will probably figure out who the best hitters are from both PA nationals and who lifted at worlds the previous year and p- make up a really solid team. You know, yeah. obviously you want to hit the automatic qualifier at worlds at so you can go, you know, so that's 1032.5 for me. And that's kind of where I want to stay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, that would be a good total, bro. That would put you right into third place at worlds. Uh, put you on the podium you know so if you can hit you're not i mean there. that's obviously unsure you know there's some people who did not show up at this year's worlds um oh, Manuelo, you know, Hudson, Ma- yeah. Manuelo can do more Mar- of that i'm guessing yeah compost maria when he if he can actually total he'll total more if um julian Hansen shows up obviously he'll total more there's a few people who just didn't show up you yeah know? yeah there's people who did show up who fucked up you know so manuelo is a bad and- dude um i'm we he all is got to, he's a we, really nice guy too he's all awesome. costa rican team are like they're great everyone you know, from costa rica is awesome they they have yeah. a great community this is one of those things absolutely about, um if you guys you if know. anyone that's listening to this like if you come to the north american regional championships the napf championships it is all age divisions and it's classic and equipped and uh, i remember the first day walking in and uh i was trying to do some filming and he's a huge dude, obviously. And he's like blocking yes. up, he's refing and he's blocking up this whole area where I'm trying to like get by. And eventually he just like, you can't come through here anymore. Um, and then he turned out to be like the sweetest guy and like massive man. And I mean, like one of the strongest refs in the world. I mean, like he's like a cat one ref. He was refing the throughout uh, up until when he was lifting, which was like on the last day of NAPF, yeah. which is like a, a seven, eight day long meet, very long meet. I definitely want to keep the NAPF circuit at oh, least dude. once. It was so cool. And uh, he, I think he was trying to break a, I can't remember, it's probably the squat world record or something like that um, at that meet. And he didn't get it. And then, you know, he went on to Denmark and, and didn't, didn't do so well, but you know, he'll come back, but he's just a great guy and the whole Costa Rican team. They have a lot of cool, uh, a lot of people that are hanging out the whole time at NAPF, like that do a lot of things, refing, coaching, wrapping each other's knees and then lifting, you know, all in the same week. And so it was, it was pretty cool to meet those guys. I'm, I bet the only thing oh, with yeah. Manuelo, he They're doesn't great. speak a ton of English. So it's like a little bit. Hard. No, he doesn't. I, I mostly communicated with him through his wife. Yeah. Um, cool. And there was a couple other, there's another guy. Um, He's done Andres, a lot. He's done a lot in it? Costa Rica. He's grown a huge gym. Yes. He was showing me his gym has like a bunch of Aleco racks and stuff, which is not common for gyms in Latin America to have like multiple yeah. Aleco racks. And um, he's done a lot to build the sport up there in Costa Rica. So he's yeah, done a great I, job. I really low key want to go to like an NAPF meet and just like hit a bench only meet, like in a, yeah, dude. in like some dude. tropical region. Cayman you know, Islands the, this year. Cayman Islands. Like I'm, I mean, it was in August. So 
Yeah, I might, I might see if I might if I could spin it. That'd be cool. That's not too far out. I mean, I mean that's no. not not too close to open worlds for you. So it might be a fun tune up. Yeah. I think you did something like that last year. You did a push pull. I did a push pull in New Mexico. Yeah, New Mexico yeah. State Fair. That was cool. You know, yeah. I was benching under a tent with like the general public watching me bench six hundred pounds. Like not just like powerlifters, but like random yeah. people off the street at the fair were like watching me bench six hundred pounds. Like, yeah, it was cool. And they let me, uh, Mike let me deadlift with my pit vipers on, which was cool. So nice. yeah, it was a that good was a fun, fun meet. Yeah, so but, yeah, take take the NAPF trip and make it into something fun. Do something like focus on something Absolutely. like making three benches. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get the momentum <laughs> rolling. You're putting me on the spot here with these three benches, dude. I'll try my best, you know, as an equipped lifter, you know, two is good. I wasn't watching uh open uh equipped worlds live, but I was watching junior worlds live, and I was like, you know, I was like, bro, please, please make the freaking make the third bench for us, you know. Um, because you were right. I mean, it was a battle and we knew everyone knows Ray. He goes to Midland. Like we know who he is. He's American. Yeah. I mean, he's a British guy, but like, he's been living in the U S he's, he's in America. Lifting. He's he, yeah, exactly. So like, he's been lifting in USAPL and everything. So we know him. Um, I actually met him at Omaha barbell, like four years ago or something like that. Like when he was just like, first, he's a game, nice kid, he's very a nice kid. kid, good competitor yeah. too, man. Like that's a yeah. good, I would He's love good. eventually one day to see you guys like, you know, going head to head a bunch. Well, he has to get out of Midland first because Midland hasn't tied to USAPL for the time being. Yeah. But he just put up a thousand fifty point five at collegiate nationals. So, you know, that'll be good to see him if he comes back yeah. to the US to the IPF. Yeah. Me and him going head to head at open rules will be a battle. Yeah. For the It'll be good ages, for the UK too. You know? It'll be good for the UK. Like if you're looking yeah, at Yeah, because I mean he'll be grown, he'll be more grown up. I'll be more grown up. We're gonna have these two big ass dudes, you know, fighting it out for the super heavyweight title. UK That's goal. is I'm looking at the team points here from Denmark, and like they're down that yeah, they're in 13th, you know. So yeah, they uh, they didn't have that many people. Yeah. So you know, they really want Ray back, but you know, he's on alone with us, so exactly but hey i mean he can we'll compete usapl for the time being for the time being yeah. he's got to get his college education all that kind of stuff out of the and way and then after he's done with midland he's gonna to have to serve his article 14 and then he can come back yeah so exactly. yeah but it'll be good it'll be good for um for equipped powerlifting you know to for have sure like this rivalry Absolutely. this head-to-head battle yeah uh, the u.s versus the uk you know it's like a historic rival so it's cool yeah absolutely um, you know but it's a it's a good fun this time you know mm-hmm. and yeah. if if he doesn't like how i do it the meats i'll chuck his tea into the fucking ocean so <laughs> <laughs> he's a nice guy though he, he is i like him he's a, along, right? he's a good guy i know we do get along there's no bad blood you know, yeah. other than like, you know, that kind of banter, you know, we're, we're fine. I, I, I have the utmost respect for Ray good and sporting he's a good, solid competitor and his performance at nationals collegiate nationals is something for me to kind of like pace. So I seeing him do 10 50, I kind of want to respond a bit. So yeah. let's see how that goes. Let's do it. Um, all right. A couple of wrap up questions here and then we'll get into like uh, some quick hitter questions, but a couple of like wrap up things you're a very good equipped lifter you're also very young like you're basically still a junior 23 mm-hmm. right now um yeah, you're also like yes you're good at social media you pay attention you're smart about the sport you know so that's why i wanted to have you on here just because there's a lot of e- personalities on the equip side like these guys that we know like joe cap and like jeff douglas and you know some like very interesting you know bonica obviously people know her bonica uh, but, yeah but, she just did Sheffield, but it keeps bouncing. She keep, she does so well at both. That I kind of forget which side she's in, but she's in both. Yeah, she you definitely. Know, no has, disrespect to Bonica, she's probably the best female powerlifter of all time. She's the best female powerlifter of all time. Yeah, in my goat. opinion, the queen of all. She's the, the goat. She is yep. the queen of powerlifting. Yep. And you know that's coming from you know someone who did eleven world championships, world games champion twenty seventeen, and Sheffield. People's, like she's done it people. all. World Games People's Champion 2022. World Games People's Champion, yes. Uh, I, that's what I was saying. Like, she got snubbed. Yeah. Um, Like, in practice, she should have been 2022, but unfortunately, she wasn't on paper. Yeah. So, in my eyes, she's two-time World Games Champion. Yeah. You know, exactly and Sheffield. Eyes. and when, you know, To win on Formula as a super heavyweight sucks. 
So to to be snubbed from a World Games victory after they put in the good lift points, which was it's less than it's less favorable for supers and Wilk. So to see her do that was insane. Yeah. You know, and it sucked to see her get, you know, get that taken away from her by the jury. Unfortunately, that's that's a sport. You but know. she had the last laugh of the year. I mean, Sheffield nine for nine, like multiple world records. Absolutely, um, yeah, that was you know, sick to watch. Great. You know, her squatting two eighty like it's a warm up. Oh, you know, insane! Absolutely. Looked so yeah. fast. So no, she's got a ton left in the tank, and then she's got a nice uh, fight in front of her at, in, in uh, Malta. Malta. Yep, yep, yep. There's some challengers coming up that might be in Belgium. Up. I think there's this chick coming up in Belgium. I forget her name off the top of my head, but that's yes. where Equipped Worlds is going to be. Or no, it's in uh, Lithuania. No, no, this is in Malta. This is in Malta. It'll be a raw lift. Oh yeah, raw Sunita, super woman. yeah from Belgium. Sunita, yeah, yeah that's going to yeah. be interesting to see. You know, absolutely. I think you know, Monique has still got a couple of years um, before, but absolutely. we'll see what happens. Um, obviously, we have the utmost faith in faith in Bonica. She's got a lot left in the tank based on what we saw at Sheffield. Um, but yep. All right. So, but the question is, like, there's all these personalities, but these aren't really household names that a lot of people know. Um, and like they are starting to know you because you're good at social media. So what is a, what is the reason why you think that equipped lifting gets sort of like a short end of the stick when it comes to social media presence? Um, there's, there's a couple avenues in my opinion, mm-hmm. one of which is the average age of an equipped lifter is a little bit on the older side. Mm-hmm. The social media savviness probably isn't really there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like there's folks who like the, the really cornerstone gods of equipped lifting, like Gene and Jeff and, um, you know, Brian Siders fell off the face of the earth. Wade Hooper fell off the face of the earth pretty much like these guys and Carl Ivar Christensen does really have a social media presence. A lot of these guys just don't care or don't yeah. really, re- this isn't the world they were in when powerlifting was at, when they were doing powerlifting. So they don't have that you know, element from it. And Mm -hmm. that's not what they gain from it. You know, they don't think that, you know, publicly posting their lifts really means anything. I try to keep certain things on the hush hush, but I do periodically post on Instagram. I think that if people see equipped lifting presented in this like very attractive, fresh new manner, it'll incentivize people to watch equipped lifting. Another avenue when it comes to social media is ignorance about what equipped lifting is in the IPF. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously there's less equipped lift, there's less equipped lifting now. There are fewer equipped lifters in the IPF than there were before. It's kind of becoming more raw and yeah. there's more people because the barrier of entry is nothing. You can just throw on a singlet and a pair of shoes at a meet and just do a meet. So yeah. you don't have to really get into gear. You don't have to know people who learned how to use gear and can coach how to use gear. So it's a little bit easier to get into it. And it's more relatable to the average Joe in the gym. But in on the other side, powerlifting doesn't necessarily have to be relatable. Absolutely. You know, you're There's watching nothing people, relatable about NASCAR, for instance. Like uh, driving or like, like even watching the Olympics. There's yeah. nothing relatable about someone running 100 meters in nine seconds. Yeah, NFL football. There's like I've or never... pro wrestling. Yeah, you know, there's exactly. nothing relatable to this. You're watching this for entertainment, oh, like world's strongest thing. man. There's nothing relatable to carrying a 400 pound Husafel for distance, U- like UFC. You watch thing, it. Like, you watch yeah. it for entertainment. Exactly. I think yeah. if people can like suspend disbelief about the gear. Mm -hmm. and focus about the weight on their back or the weight in their hands and like the battles that happen in equip lifting with the attempt selection and like making a missing and like all that sort of thing. It can be very presentable. Yeah. yeah. So we get snubbed in social media because there's a lot of these, you know, younger lifters who don't know the history of the sport and don't know how single ply and equip lifting really held up the foundation of power lifting that go on and talk shit about equip lifting, like how it's cheating. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, if you, in my opinion, if you think it's that easy to just throw on a suit and squat 200 pounds more, why don't you do it yourself? Well, yeah. you know, like, you know, they always have an excuse. Like, I don't know. I don't have a suit. Like, well, you know, I don't know if I could do it. Like, ex- exactly. The, the question though is like, because like you nailed on like Jeff Douglas, Gene Bell, like these are some personalities, like if people got to know them a little bit and, and like you also hit on these other sports, it's entertainment. It doesn't have to be relatable. Like, and so what I'm trying to get at is sort of like, can we get these equipped guys and gals out there to like package up their stuff into like a more entertaining way and put it out yes. there on social media and make it entertaining. Like, that's what I love about, Before. about you 
you know, like you, you, I, you had a reel that blew absolutely went crazy earlier this year. I remember, I don't even know yes. what, what, what exactly happened with it. And but, there's some of my quip squats on TikTok that I have a few hundred thousand. Yeah, views. exactly. Yes. And so that's what I'm saying um, is like, is like making yeah, as entertaining power- as it is. If, yeah. if you're not putting content out there, it's hard to blame anyone for like, right. for like why it's not picking up. And I think it's very there's, marketable. There's a lot of, you know, there's a big name at quip policy and Blaine Sunder. He posts his stuff. Yeah. Goes yeah. viral. He benches a thousand pounds. He posts it on Instagram and gets a million views. Yeah. You know, it goes viral. People see like the 500 kilo world record go, gets on the sports center. There's, there's yeah. definitely an audience there. There's some people who just like say, Oh, it's equipped lifting. So it's cheating or whatever. There's always going to be naysayers, but then again, yeah. you can say there's naysayers in raw lifting with the sumo deadlift. So the deadlift bar that goes up to like your mid shin before it comes off the ground or yeah. more recently with the IPF arching the bench controversy with the range of motion, there's, Always going to be naysayers, right? Yeah. Um, in my opinion, there was a time and a place where we had the exposure and equip lifting, and there's the money and equip lifting. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a meet back in the day in St. Petersburg called Super Cup of Titans, and it was in one central location like Sheffield, and the grand prize was forty thousand dollars like mm-hmm. Sheffield. Nice, so there that would attract only single ply lifters, and it was just single ply. Mm-hmm. And it kind of dwindled because the person who kept winning, it was Andre Milanichev. who just show up, win, show up, win, show up, win. And interest kind of fizzled out. Yeah. And it wasn't in the IPF. So all the good IPF lifters couldn't go without getting suspended. Uh-huh. So they kind of, you know, faded away. But we had our Sheffield. Okay. And if we can package it in sort of like a grand spectacle way, like perhaps maybe have been like, you know, with Classic Nationals this year in Austin, we had the one platform multiple cameras like the camera crew following the lifters are going to the platform broadcasting like it's a real serious sporting event yeah um obviously there's too many people in the whole equipped roster to do that this year but going forward i think we should have an equipped prime time session on one platform just like classic nationals in austin have like the same overlays camera crews live stream broadcasts and just showcase the best equipped men and women in the country in one session Mm-hmm. on one platform to really show the world what equipped lifting truly is. And that will kind of be like, okay, yeah. this isn't just goofy people in a monolift. This isn't just like, you know, you know, range of motion where they pass high squats. These are people who are poetry in these equipped, like these pieces of equipment that look pretty close to raw bench, like raw lifting, you know? So especially in the IPF close to a because... raw squat or a raw bench. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the IPF single ply looks different. So yeah. that would help bring, you know, a more fluid idea of what single ply is. And I think that we should do video packages to kind of showcase and hype up the top equipped lifters, just like the top raw lifters, like going into their meets and really show the world equipped on the same scale as raw. You know, obviously this, there's not the same level of interest off the gate. There's always going to be some scrutiny because of its equipment, its equipment, yeah. But if you present it in a way that's very similar to how the raw lifting is presented, there's going to be a mutual respect to the work that's being put in here. Yeah. yeah. And that's the I way mean, forward. I think, I think definitely like from our perspective at PA, like my perspective as a creative director and, um, you know, kind of like trying to promote equipped more, we, we definitely are. It's definitely a goal. It's definitely something that we put effort and resources into. Um, I remember I kind of like realized that we were doing it when, someone made a meme about like PA trying to get us to care about, about equipped lifting again, or something like this. Like there was, I think it was like subpar, like one of the major meme accounts that made something like that. Um, I think it was squat meme deadlift. Okay. Maybe. And I was just like, I was like, Hey, that's cool. At least like someone's kind of recognizing that like we are pushing equipped as well. Um, I think this will be a, a, a very big, the next few years uh, leading up into the next world games for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, a big time for equipped lifting again. And I think like on our side of it, it was difficult in year one because we had so many of our lifters were not with PA, they were with USVI, you know? And so like, um, like even at world games, we didn't, we didn't get to take a full squad. Like we had handpicked as the host nation, we got to get four lifters in and that was pretty much it. Like we didn't really get to have a full team if we could have had no. a full team, we might have gotten some of those people from from USVI to come over sooner. And then yeah, but they have... were they were stuck with VI. They, they yeah, couldn't change World countries. Games. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So so now we're finally starting. You know, after Denmark, people are coming over. We're seeing people. You know, sign up, become members. I think Taylor La Chapelle, who's like a big star, um, and yeah, also Taylor. young, 
young like yourself, Noah Johnson, Kimmy Johnson, like Kimmy's coming over from USBI. She's got a, she's one who has a massive social media following. Um, so she I think does really, you know, she has like 80,000 followers on Instagram. Yeah. She's really good with the social media. Yeah. You know, and she posts her that... clips on social media too. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's exposure. We need some of that to rub off on Noah. Um, like, cause he's strong as hell, but Noah's little... strong as hell, but he records all his lifts facing backwards. So, you know, <laughs> it's hard to, and you know, he's lifted in I mean, this bunker. I know it, it's a good coaching. It's a good coaching angle, but it's not really a good Instagram angle. Like get yeah. get two phones. You know, you have your dad yeah. in there. Yeah. They're they're actually in a carport. <laughs> like it's no, like it's this a crazy bunker behind. that's like insulated yeah. and heaters. It's nice in though. Wisconsin. It's cool. It's yeah. a very it's cool in a different way. But um, you know, production value on some of the equip side of things is lacking behind. Like not at IPF Worlds, production value at, in Denmark looked amazing. I mean, it was as good as any. Yes. Um, but, but certainly from a lifter standpoint, it's like, we need equip lifters to also like meet us halfway and put stuff out there more like hire, like a lot of these raw guys, like I was just talking with Delaney, he's talking about, you know, hiring a full-time videographer and stuff like this. Like, so it's like equip, you gotta, you want to return on your investment. It's like, you got to invest a little bit on things like that. You know, um, they don't, yeah. you don't see equip lifters with like camera crews following them around and stuff like you will no. with like Taylor. It's not or Delaney also or the Gavin. way we do things. It's not yeah. how we function. Well, you like, got to start we doing it, bro. That, you like, yeah. we got to get you guys like up, you know, doing it more. Cause, cause honestly, it's like without that audience in those metrics, being able to point to like number of views and things like this, it's hard to get sponsors. It's hard to get a lot of things going. Yeah. So, so I like um, that one you... equip lifter. Yeah, go ahead. One equip lifter that we do like that does do the videography stuff and the video edits uh -huh. and has a good social media presence is Bryce Krawcheck up in Canada. Yeah. Calgary yeah. Barbell. He was, he did a lot of equip lifting and he followed it on yeah. YouTube and he had a lot of YouTube subscribers and Instagram followers. He, presented it very well and people cared yes. people thought it was cool exactly so, you know we you know bring that energy over to equipped lifting in the united states and powerlifting america would be a great start to getting our yeah. social media footing a little bit higher up there 100 percent. like we're definitely like um prioritizing it i think now especially there's even more more you know it's it's more of a priority now because we've got the full squad. Um, we're going right. to be able to take a team that's going to actually be pretty competitive to mm -hmm. Worlds and everything this year. So we'll do a lot of promo leading into it, just like we would the Classic Open team. Um, yep. It's a little bit more difficult, like in where we were last year, you know, where it's like we don't want to hype up these too too much, and then the people are getting in last place and stuff like this. And so um, mm -hmm. it's it's more difficult, you know, like we kind of put our foot in our mouth a little bit if we do that. Um, so we're definitely kind of. On, on my side of things, at least like we're trying to think of ways to, to make it cool. Um, yep. And that's why having you, you know, on here and giving you like more of a role to kind of be like our, our equipped guy to like help us navigate this whole equipped universe. Um, you're a good personality. We've got some other ones we'll be introducing to the world as well. You know, like, like Kimmy and Noah, like the Johnsons and, you know, Kelsey McCarthy and who all the, all the world champs that are possibly coming over and everything like that. Joe cap for sure. I keep telling, I keep threatening to expose the world to Jeff Douglas as well. <laughs> you should. And I really he's want a to. Great like, guy, but he's, he's a character. He's amazing, guy. amazing guy, amazing character. One of the best. Yeah, my people dad that... stole one of his beers at nationals. And he didn't give a shit. Like you know, he just yeah. pulled like a beer out of a cooler and he's like, "Yeah, whatever, have a beer." You know, it was, was two a.m. We nights. were all done with the meet, and you know, it was it was a good time. That was one of the best nights, and like the camaraderie that I experienced that night amongst all those equipped guys. Jeff being foremost among them um like you said like the bar closed ran out of beer or whatever you know and he's like hey don't worry i got a whole cooler full of beer and he breaks out this bag cooler um which yep, was that's, amazing that's equip lifting yeah, We're, yeah it takes a village to do it and there's definitely a huge community of it it's not yeah. as solo as raw lifting raw lifting you can do a whole meet by yourself yeah. you know obviously it's great to have someone looking at your attempts and everything but you can do a whole meet by yourself equip you can't do it it ain't happening you know, there's all these weird documentaries about weird things that I get sucked into that don't have like mainstream following until like Netflix does a thing on them. Um, and I feel like that's the case. Like if, if some, if we had a film crew there filming us that night in Orlando and they saw like how much fun we had and like, and just the conversations and like how it was like so heated until late, like three o'clock in the morning, something like that. Um, they see the subculture of it. I think it has that kind of appeal for like a documentary film, but anyway, yeah, like remake that. power unlimited. 
with a yeah. modern day single ply lifters because that there was a powerlifting documentary power yeah. limited where you know kirk karowski is in the interview yeah, yeah. room talking about he's throwing plates at people at 5 p.m on monday like you know just i like, tried to watch it know. mike z has tried to show it to me so many times but i think now it's like pay-per-view only or something yeah like you, find... you need to find it was on youtube the whole documentary was on youtube at one point it was it's a sick it's... documentary if you have a chance to watch the whole thing yeah. you should it's a really good film and it's you actually know, like so. made by a documentarian. Like they have a director of yes. photography. It's like they Absolutely. do audio, yeah. like they do interviews. They it's like a real documentary. Um, I've seen yeah, they did that with West Side versus the world. Yeah, you know, absolutely. same thing. They even had Ron Perlman narrate it. So they had a yeah. whole production yeah. with it. No, it was you great. Know? I mean, so that's what we, we need. just need to do that again. Um, on but with yep. the, the single ply crew and then um kind of sure. refresh it a little bit. We see uh SBD doing it a little bit with the the classic side, like with their road to Sheffield series, like doing interviews and going all in, they could put all that together with more stuff that they saw um, in Sheffield and have yeah. filmed over the years and like make a documentary about the classic side. Yeah. But like um, rogue did road to the Arnold. Okay. You yeah. know, where they had like those video documentaries of the yeah. interview and like recording yeah. some of their training, like the same thing with Sheffield, like that should yeah. be, you know, yeah. leading up to the world games next year, that should be an, a definite thing to do. Yeah, for sure. Hopefully we'll have our media team, you know, grown and grown up and big enough to where we can pull off something like that. Um, off the cuff, what's your elevator pitch? Why raw powerlifters and fans of raw powerlifting should tune in and watch like equipped nationals, equipped worlds and world games and all that. Like why, why should they watch? What's the appeal to like, um, your average Joe raw lifter? Like why should they tune in and watch equipped stuff? Because it rides the line much harder than raw does mm -hmm. if you want to see raw lifting with actual edgier seat suspense turn on some equip lifting and see people ride the lightning in their gear that's how it's done mm -hmm. yeah all right good dude that's a good elevator pitch you got me thinking about it <laughs> ride the lightning some good catchphrases in there all right so um let's do some quick hitters and we'll wrap this up so we've been going for okay. a minute here um where are we at what's your day job I am a bus driver a bus in driver. Colorado. I, you know, I drive. Hmm. Yeah. I drive. I mean, I drive for a transit agency up here in the Denver area as a subcontractor. Huh. And I usually drive around eight to 10 hours a day, five to six days a week. And it's pretty low physical stress. Yeah. But it keeps me, you know, where I can spend most of my physical energy on powerlifting. And it's a pretty decent paying job as well. So I enjoy it. I find it hard. Um, anytime I take a road trip and, and like, I'm driving a lot, I'm like sitting yeah. a lot. Like you see, yeah, I'm, people, sta I'm at a standing desk. Like I'm always, yeah. I almost never sit. I, I definitely, when I have breaks and layovers, I will, you know, get out and stretch my legs, stretch my lats, mm -hmm. like, you know, get myself all, you know, stretched up because especially if I'm doing squats after I work, you know, I have to, make sure my yeah. hips and my shoulders yeah. are all nice and supple, but yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, you know, if you pay the, if you don't pay the fare, I'll stand up and I'll scare the shit out of you. Nice. So yeah. yeah exactly. Um, where do you train? I, I train at customized nutrition and exercise. It's mm -hmm. a private, um, bodybuilding powerlifting strongman type gym in Boulder, Colorado. I split my time between there and elevate barbell in Fort Collins, which mm -hmm. is where Natalie and Bryce train. Mm -hmm. And if I need to do a quick bro session or quick, you know, secondary bench session, I have a gold's gym right near my apartment that I can walk to. So nice. All right. And you reach gyms. And so next question, where'd you grow up? I was born and raised in Boulder, Colorado. Okay. And I've lived here basically my whole life in the Boulder County area, Northern Colorado. And I currently live in Longmont. So Okay. Yeah. So kind of give people like where it's like you're working in Denver, you're training in, uh, Fort Collins slash Boulder. How work like, between, do you have to travel to train? I mean, I primarily work between Boulder and Denver. Our, we have two offices okay. and we have satellites in a couple other cities. Um, but I kind of go from place to place. I was born in Boulder and mm -hmm. I live around 11 miles Northeast in Longmont. So I do, my my work is primarily in Boulder, so I commute from my work to mm -hmm. my gym. It's like five minutes apart uh, by car, mm -hmm. and I train there and then head back home. Or if I'm working a different shift, I'll come in first and then train and then go to work. 
Mm-hmm. And how, so it's how pretty, hard is it for you to get to elevate? Um, elevate is a day off kind of thing because okay. it is 40 minutes away by car. Okay. We, damn. we drive, I drive 40 minutes up there, 40, 45 minutes. And do you there. do like, you're mostly like you're super like intense, super heavy equipped, equipped bench. We always do up there because, um, you know, he's not in PA currently, but shout out Shane Cohen. He is my lift off and chief up there. And we have the Alico rack to play with. We have good equipment up there and good spotters. So Which are all necessary. Bench, do you just bench once a week or you bench twice a week? Um, I bench four times a week. Oh, okay. Shit. That's three a raw, um, one ram day with a in conjunction with one of my raw days, and then one shirt a day on its own. Okay. So four that's times a week. We go to elevate for yes. The Got shirt it. a day is an elevate just for safety reasons. Yeah, because we so- do have a comp bench at my main gym, but it ain't meant for a quick bench. Okay. It's like the lift off platform is behind <laughs> the bench, so you can't lift me off. See, there's so killing your back. I could just see the documentary now. You're like driving the bus, you're like getting out, stretching the back out, like smashing some food, and then like work your way down over to elevate. That's basically my job. You know, know, with the crew, it's like snowing in Colorado. Um, no, that's cool. Um, and that, that's a thing, and, but like, like you know, if they really wanted to do it, I primarily work early morning shifts, not tomorrow morning, thankfully, but yeah, I'm I primarily get into work before five in the morning, so. Nice. You know, to, to have me walk in and pitch black, you know, pre trip in the bus and then like driving and getting off work and going to go train and hit these massive squats and benches and stuff like that's that's cool, definitely. Yeah, in the camaraderie and like the team aspect of needing that, those, those like specialized people that you'll only find at Elevate that know how to like yeah. spot and know how to do um, the equip stuff, like that's critical that you're gonna have to drive an extra 40 minutes for that every week. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, thankfully, sure. I mean, I go with my dad. And yeah. usually I have him drive. So, but nice. he's, my dad is like one of the, you know, greatest support systems I've ever had. He's been here and involved in helping me out since day one. So, yeah. you know, he has been a very strong network. He was at, he was with me for open nationals. He couldn't really afford to go to worlds with me, but, you know, he was there, you know, in spirit, yeah. obviously. And also on messenger telling me to eat real food. So nice. Nice. he really helps me out. He, he, he kicks me in my ass when I need to be kicked in my ass, but he also, you know, praises me when I'm doing well. So that's, and I always see him great in to have video. that support system. Yeah. Yes. I see him in a lot of your videos. He's, on bench He's day, a constant especially. presence, you know? Yeah. Like that guy is, you know, he very, he really cares about my success in powerlifting 100%. and he really, you know, wants me to do well because like, you know, he's wrapping my knees after he's had a stroke, you mm-hmm. know, and that mm-hmm. fucked up his grip, but he's still trying his best to wrap, you know, wrap my knees, which is very, you know, very thoughtful. And I'm very grateful for that. So, yeah, I met him yeah. in Orlando. He's an awesome guy. Super nice. He, he is. the love he, he is. for you. Like you're his pride Absolutely. You so. know. It's great. it's great. And he, he DMs me a little bit too uh, yeah. on Instagram as well. Uh, so I like it. I like yeah, how to catch actually... that, to catch that first Nat stub on father's day was very poignant. So yeah, yeah. It was a good right. gift for him. That was, you know? that's right. That was father's day. It that was father's nice. day. And I got my first Nat stub for him. So we're good. Yeah. And you guys were there and everything. That was cool, man. Yep. It was fun hanging out with everyone. Yeah. Um, he is going to be coming to Phoenix or for, for this year's national. So you'll see him again. All right, yeah. good, good. I'm looking forward to it. What's his name again? Boyd. Boyd, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. All right, Boyd. I hope he listens to this. We give him a shout out. Crazy good shout out here. Yeah. You're a good son, man. All right. Um, yeah. a couple more of these quick quitters. What was your first sport? Um, I'm I'm one of those weird odd types. I didn't really get into any sports until powerlifting. Okay. Powerlifting. Like I, I did some physical activities here and there. I was actually um kind of like trying to be a triathlete at one point which was kind of stupid because of my frame and i was a i would do some pretty long distance bike rides and you know i was heavier set and i would be biking up these switchback mountain roads and in, in the back ends of boulder and that's probably where i got a lot of my leg strength from you know so i probably. think you know riding my ass up a hill you know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it was it was probably good legs work and that was what i was doing primarily before i became a power lifter was just you know cycling and all that stuff so nothing no team sports nothing like that i just never got into it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so when next question when you're not powerlifting, what's your idea of a good time like like Eating. If you could just if you could just take a weekend away from real life like a fantasy weekend what would you do i would probably go up to a hot spring nice. sit 
in relax in a hot spring, you know, maybe up in the mountains, go for, you know, some downhill skiing and, you know, like, is that the true Colorado fountain? Like, and then have a good meal with good people in a good restaurant and have a good time with them. You know, I'm not super like, you know, I don't have the energy to socialize all the time, but when I do, I like, have a good conversation. I like having good yeah, company yeah. around with good food. That's my idea of a good time. For sure, man. I know that about you. Um, we hit it off right away in Orlando, Absolutely. In Orlando airport <laughs> in one of the restaurants, the sports bar and the terminal. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. You know. There's going to be um, better food choices in Scottsdale. Oh, so yeah. Looking like there's going to be some awesome stuff for us to do right outside the you know, hotel. Whether we well. can pick up the tab afterwards is anyone's guess, but, you know. Uh, yeah, exactly. We'll have to save our pennies. Um, <clears throat> so you kind of answer this one, but do you prefer mountains or beaches or neither? I prefer mountains, um, nice. but I do like a beach from time to time. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, my dad was born and raised in Honolulu, and I was okay, born that's... and raised in Colorado, so it's an interesting dynamic. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. That's very interesting. Yep. Um, that he moved uh, from from Hawaii to... He moved around a lot as a kid. But, you know, he went from Hawaii and then he went to college a bit in California and then he came to Boulder. Yeah. Gotcha. That's cool. All right. Um, how old are you? Again, we already answered this. 23. 23. Right? Yeah. Turning 24 when? Uh, November 6th. November 6th. Oh, so your birthday will be around when Worlds is. Around Worlds, yeah. You know, sometimes it actually is during Worlds, but, you know. That's awesome. We have work to do, so we can't be celebrating right away. No, but we'll now this year, I'll be just turning 24, 13th through 19th of November is when Equip Worlds is. Nice. Um, do you have a nickname other than Zen? The Piston. The Piston. The piston. All right. That's Zen people, the Piston. Yeah. People really call you that in the wild? Yes. Um, like, yo, not the in the here. wild. But on Instagram, yes, and okay. a lot of powerlifters do call me the piston. It was coined by Nick Manders. He was the first one Sweet. to call me that. So, all right. So when I when I see you, I'm, when we do the press conference, we'll just refer to you as the piston. Yeah, and, shout uh, out Nick Manders Scott's for giving me that nickname. Awesome, Canadian yeah. phenom. Yeah, no, he's a badass. Um, <clears throat> all right, next one. Who's a person that you look up to in powerlifting? Joe okay. Capolino, Blaine Sumner, Brian Siders. Carl Ingvar Christensen, um, Andre Konovalov, the Hall of Greats, you know, Gene Bell, Jeff Douglas, um, Wade Hooper, yeah. all these single ply lifters have come before me. Another one is Shane Heyman, you know, just a complete powerhouse, you know, could dunk a basketball at 400 pounds kind of guy, you know, like wow. just, I can't narrow it down to one person because each of them has their own nuances that we all tie this into the Hall of the Gods. This is why when people keep asking me, like, who are you going to have on the podcast to be like your equipped guy? I'm like, I always say Zen because of right there, like, you know, the game, like you've studied the past, like, you know, who the legends are on your side of it. Um, I can't tell you how many powerlifters you could ask that are your age, you know, 23 years, years old, who can barely name someone past like that, that hasn't competed in like the last two years, you know, John uh, hack, like, yeah. Okay. Cool. John hack. But yeah, I mean, John hack, like people, we were talking, uh, Jesse Norris is like, people don't know who he is, you know, I, I know who Jesse Norris is, huh? you know, I mean, I, I like doing my research. I like watching these old yeah. videos. That's actually yeah. what I do. In a lot of my free time, I will watch old yeah. clips of worlds and people competing in attempts from back in the day and just like watch them watch what they do and like really see their technique it's like watching film as a football player you know exactly like you are exactly learning from say. them that's the, you know it's weird because in photography we run into this thing where people say oh i don't want to study these older people because then i'll start to like see like them or whatever and i'm like good you you should see like them um you don't hear that in in basketball or football you don't hear lebron being like i never wanted to watch jordan because i don't want to like copy any of his moves you know it's like that's want to be an old sports. head yeah yeah that's ridiculous in sports talk like for if you look at any of the major sports they know like people from decades ago whereas in powerlifting like i'm guilty of it too like not knowing people from two decades ago you know that's very difficult whereas you just named off like a bunch of ogs um this is why like you're you're smarter about powerlifting than i am so that's why i want to get you on here as like a co-host um, but for sure, um, that was a really good answer. So I, I appreciate that. All right. What's your favorite sport to watch? Um, I would go on, on a limb and say Olympic weightlifting. Really? To watch. You watch? Yes, Olympic weightlifting. to watch. I do. Um, I'm saying that because as a spectator sport, they got it really down pat. Um, they have really? what powerlifting doesn't. 
which is um what? it's just it's quicker okay really because i'm you're less engaged. telling me it's longer um last week it's quicker in terms of like the length of the sessions because they're following okay. themselves sometimes it's a rising bar format yeah um, it's faster and the lifting itself is more poetic looking than yeah, powerlifting like more, i yeah. love watching powerlifting i love watching strongman but like as a spectator and just to watch someone do something and just be like in awe of it I mean, not pro wrestling. I like pro wrestling, but Olympic weightlifting, you know, pro wrestling is more of an entertainment spectacle than a yeah, sport. Yeah. Um, but yes, it's like, wow. Olympic you're the first, you're the first one who I think who hasn't said football. Um, I don't watch football. You don't watch it at all. No, you I mean, I've never football? gotten into it. Do you, do you own any like Broncos shirts or jackets or anything like a hat? No, I got that? an avalanche hat to make a parody video for a, a, a guy back in the day, but that was the only sports merch I've ever bought. I still <laughs> have the fucking tag on that hat. Like, you I know, love, I, you should I bought it. it for one thing, you know, I, <laughs> what, what seven, it, it's been nine years since I bought that hat. I don't think they'll take it back, but they have won the Stanley cup. So you might as well keep it. It's you practically know. vintage at this point. Um, that's yeah. so hilarious that the reason, you bought a piece of sports like memorabilia is was to make up to wear it backwards yeah and it was a parody of this like like this religious like preacher guy on instagram or youtube way back in the day and he would wear this like backwards red cap and i was like oh. i want to make fun of him parody him in a video but like i don't have any red baseball caps laying around so i had to go buy one you know so like yeah, whatever is- fit yeah this is why I think you're, you know, beyond this, you just hit on like the other side of the coin for you is like, you're, you're not just super smart and great athlete about the sport and everything, but you're also kind of have one foot on the side of like being an entertainer or at least being tapped in to social media to the point of like, you know how to use it, you know? So that's really good. Yeah. That's something, that's what we there, need. There's you're, some you're, more risque things I've done in that time back in the I day, know. but yes, I was. I heard stories and stuff. Know. You got to clean it up now. You're, you're a PA athlete. You're representing the USA. But I know. Still, you can still know. be entertaining. I have to clean it up a little bit. <clears throat> you can still be entertaining. Yep. And, I was um, a little bit of a loose cannon back in the day, but I'm a little bit better now with it. So, you know, funny though, you girl funny. out of it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, let me see. So if you had a favorite football team, what you, you just don't have one. So let's just skip that one. I really um, wouldn't care. That is, that's awesome to me. I mean, you're so rare. You're so, you're so weird, man. Um, you like, you like Olympic lifting, you like power lifting, you don't like football, um, yeah. which is, which is cool. I mean, that's why, that's why I love about powerlifting. We have all types, you know, it's not just people with sports backgrounds. There's a lot of like video game people in here as well. And people with phds you know yeah like jonathan keiko is a uh you know professional league you know league player yeah yeah exactly league of legends you know that's why he's league of lifting because he's he was pro gamer before he was a power lifter yeah and then we got ray williams has got a phd over here you know what i mean so it's like we got all types it's cool it's a big tent um everyone can come all right music genre what what type of music do you generally Um, listen to i'm i like a lot of uh edm i'm very i'm a very big fan of alenium and mm-hmm. I like listening to their music and a lot of other EDMs like like type track like Alan Walker, um, a few like mostly like chill like melodic EDM. Not like you know I do ha- like certain hardcore style of that music. Like one of my favorite uh, producers is um, Cyril S three R L. Um, I think okay. that's how you pronounce it. And I do like some other non. EDM bands. I like Nightwish, Symphonic Metal, Sabaton, another one. Uh, my music taste is a very mixed bag. And a lot of it actually, you know, I'm listening to top 40 pop hits while I'm listening while I'm training because it kind of helps me get through things a little bit better, you mm-hmm. know. And I'm a big fan of Kevin Gates as well. Like oh, when my, my carry on, every time I say carry on in a post, that's from Kevin Gates, the intro from his Casa album. So I do like i i have like three or four genres of music that i listen to but i have my favorite musicians and producers and artists in each of them and like with rap i'm, I'm a very big fan of kevin gates that's badass you did you know i was yeah. gonna ask you who your favorite rapper is next kevin gates <laughs> kevin that's gates awesome. yep i love kevin you're, gates you're on it bro um all right movie movie genres like just genre you don't have to give like specifics um genre it's like drama slash thriller um like you know my i have a plethora of favorite movies in terms of like the messages hit, hit that a they couple. send um like 
in particular, like in terms of like a message as well as like an audience engagement standpoint, I'm a very big fan of Falling Down. Um, okay. Wow. Michael Schumacher. Wow. Not Michael. Sch- I think Michael Douglas. I think that's his name. Schumacher is a director. Michael Schumacher is a fucking F1 driver. Yeah. But the guy's last name is Schumacher that directed it. I forget first name off the top of my head. It's pretty. <laughs> You know, I've been talking for a while. Um, I'm falling down with Michael Douglas, I think. You know, so like that guy. And then um, another one of my favorite movies is Heat. Oh, Um, wow. You're into Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. Um, Yeah. Yeah, you're different. I I think it's a good one. (laughs) Another um, Robert De Niro movie that I'm a big fan of is Taxi Driver. Uh, He did pretty well, you know. So you're a De Niro fan. But Heat is a very solid film. From a visual effects standpoint, I think the ending was bad. The ending kind of sucked. It should have been the other way around. If you haven't watched the movie, I'm not going to spoil it. Yeah, don't worry. But it, the I've definitely seen the it, the, but... the heist scene in that film. The 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 sound effects were not piped in with the guns. They were real sound effects. They had blank rounds in actual rifles, and they had tactical training from you know police and sf guys to like really make it realistic so i think and it was a really well produced film off the get-go and a really good story as well but yeah i mean more recent modern movies i'm a big fan of inception i think inception was a very well done movie um the last movie of recent years that i've watched i was a really big fan of is um hell or high water um, that was a good one. Hell or High Water was written by the same guy who wrote Sicario, which is another very, you know, pretty good thriller movie. But Hell or High Water is more like a modern Western. It okay. isn't like a spaghetti Western type. It's a, more of like a dramatic Western themed film. Cool. But I love Westerns. I'm going to watch the, the shot compositions in the rural Texan area that they filmed. Like they filmed a lot of this stuff and it's set in rural Texas and the composition is really good. Like. Cool. The color grade and everything like really has this Western feel, but like the, the storytelling is very modern in its nature and it discusses a lot of modern themes, you know. So I Dude, really enjoyed that film as well. Would you say that you are like a film buff? I mean, damn, not you just killed another layer. My dad um went to Cal State Long Beach for film school and he does do okay. a lot of film production related work with a friend of his in California. He was actually just out there. So, you know, he made a little short film for a film festival that his friend helps, you know, organize and, you know, does stuff Ooh. for called the Poppy Jasper International Film Festival in Gilroy, California. And he directed a little short film, wrote and directed and edited this little short film, the two of them. So, so has he always shown you like really good films, like since you were young? I kind of searched for them myself. Okay. And he's not like um, trying to censor, like to prevent you from watching these like more adult type films. No, like, he never or... did. You know, yeah. like for Christ's sake, when I was four years old, he had the Matrix on. He let me watch the Matrix. So, you know, yeah, like yeah. he didn't get he doesn't care. You know, if it's a good movie, it's a good movie. Yeah. You know, that's good, man. That's good. You got good. You got good movie values. Yep. <laughs> All right. A uh, couple last ones here. Um what is your favorite thing about powerlifting? The community, especially in the single ply part of it. We have a very good network of people. That's it's really good. Right on, bro. That's that's absolutely right on. That's my that's my answer too. Um, what do you want to see change in powerlifting? And this is the last question. I want there to be less ignorance to the history of the sport. Hmm. I want people to really research and understand powerlifting in a way that they don't see on King of the Lifts or Two White Lights or any of these mainstream podcasts and powerlifting pundits, if you can call them that. Yeah. Um, because there's a lot to the sport that no one knows. And I think that the sport in the community in general will be less toxic to each other and less really vile and negative especially towards equip lifting if they understood the history to equip lifting and as well as like in powerlifting in general if they understood the roots of the sport when we were lifting in the goddamn basement of a hotel holiday and express like you know to like these huge convention centers and stages like you know the growth of the sport it really show a level of appreciation for what we are now 
That's a great answer, man. Man, you're super wise beyond your years. Like obviously with films and uh, with, with powerlifting. And uh, I really appreciate you coming on here, man, and, and giving us so much time. Like, I don't know how long we've been going for, like, at least, like, two hours now. About a couple hours. Joel Schumacher <laughs> is the name of the director. For now. I confuse okay. him with Michael Schumacher, the F1, the F1 driver. driver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The F1 There's driver. a lot of rap so songs. So I fucked that up. Reference Schumacher There's a lot of him. Schumachers out there, so I mixed two of them up. But that was with, you know, Michael Douglas. You know, yeah. that, that film was a pretty good – it's a pretty good message – it tied into the film and its subtext and it was pretty well directed as well in my opinion so yeah i saw but it going it back to me when i saw it like i was way younger it was yeah, pretty like, when i first watched it as a kid and to when i first to when i watch it now it's a much different perspective that's interesting i sure. have to rewatch it yeah all right, bro. Well, we're going to wrap it. Um, yep. Thank you again, man, for, Absolutely. for being so generous. I'm going to lean on you heavily for all this equipped stuff. Like we, we equipped as a priority for power team America. It's equipped. It's a priority for me as a creative director and like really wanting to make it look cool and just promote it in the same way that we promote everything in powerlifting, you know, in everything in power team America. So. Absolutely. All right, bro. All right. Well, thanks again. And, uh, yep. yep. Thank for you everyone for having who's, me. For everyone who's listening online, um, you know, this was Zen McCollum, equipped 120 plus kilo lifter. Cheer him on at nationals. He'll be competing in June 4th in Scottsdale. And so with that, man, peace out. Peace.